Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 28th, 2022 meeting of the uh, Arlington Redevelopment Board. This open meeting of the Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely for the governor's extension of the executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. For this meeting, the ARB is convening via Zoom, as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We also ask that you do not play any recordings in your background when you are speaking to the board. All materials need to be shared through, um, through the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development. Jenny Raitt and Kelly Linema are running the materials for the meeting. Uh, with that, I'll uh, start by um, letting everyone know that tonight is the last night of the four public hearings for warrant articles proposed for 2022 town meeting. Uh, there were three previous nights um, and tonight wraps up the 18 articles. Consistent with past hearings, the ARB will be hearing from applicants and the public wishing to speak on each of these articles as scheduled. The board will pose any questions to the applicants, but will res reserve discussion and voting on each article to recommend action or no action until after all hearings have been completed, which will be next Monday on April 4th. So typ the typical format for each article will be to hear from the department regarding the memo that has been prepared, followed by up to a six minute presentation by the petitioner. We'll then take questions from the board followed by public comments. We'll then ask the petitioner to address any questions and take final comments from the board members. So just to run through our procedures for public hearing, uh, the scope of the public hearing is the subject matter as was posted on the agenda and is shared on the screen right now. Any person wishing to address the ARB on the subject matter of an agenda item shall uh, signify your desire to speak by raising your hand when I announce consideration of each item. To raise your hand and Zoom on your computer, go to the participants and select raise your hand on your phone, or excuse me, raise your hand or on your phone, press star six to unmute yourself. After being recognized to speak, each person will uh, announce uh, preface their comments, excuse me, by announcing your first, last name, and street address. Each person addressing the board will be limited to up to three minutes. You, um, if time's allowed, if time allows, excuse me, I may be able to allow you to speak if you have a new and different point to make or a question to ask on the topic, and that's if time allows. Uh, the board may receive any oral or written evidence, but such evidence is restricted, restricted to the subject matter on the agenda. Immaterial or unduly repetitious evidence may be excluded. Any person present at public hearing requested not to applause, or, excuse me, applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statement made or action taken at such hearing. This includes using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Hearing participants shall refrain from interrupting other speakers and conduct themselves in a civil and courteous manner. Speakers should address all questions through the chair, which is me. Speakers shall not attempt to engage in debate or dialogue with the ARB members or hearing participants. Questions may or may not be answered during the public hearing and will be addressed at the discretion of the chair. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and uh, take a roll call to ensure that all of the board members are present and can hear me. We'll start with uh, Kim Lau. Present. Jean Benson. Present. Melissa Tintopoulos. Present. Steve Reblack. Good evening, Madam Chair. Thank you. And uh, I am Rachel Zemberry, the chair of the board. We also have um, two members of the Department of Planning and Community Development with us this evening, Jennifer Raitt. Present. And Kelly Linema. Present. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, the, we'll move right ahead into the first agenda item, which are is the continued uh, warrant article public hearings for 2022 town meeting. And we will begin with article 32, which is the zoning bylaw amendment uh, for the zoning board of appeals rules and regulations. And uh, this item was inserted at the request of the redevelopment board at the um, 
uh, per discussion with uh, Christian Klein, who is the uh, chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, so first I'll turn it over to Jenny Rape to see if you have any um, comments or anything additional that you'd like to share related to the memo that the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development created. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, very briefly, just to say that we are, you know, this is a, basically an administrative amendment in nature, um, which is something that followed recodification, where we tried to <laughs> remove a lot of the administrative rules and processes from the zoning bylaw into separate rules and regulations. And so this would enable the Zoning Board of Appeals to do the same. The Redevelopment Board, as you know, did that after 2018's recodification, and we have since amended it a couple of times. And so this will allow the Zoning Board of Appeals to do the same um, and to begin to do that with removal of uh, these items from the zoning bylaw at this time, which it, um, and they're enumerated here. Um, rules about and regulations about hiring uh, are there uh, processes around Chapter 40B comprehensive permits, um, which they will codify in their own rules and regulations. So um, I don't have anything further to say about this. I don't know if Mr. Klein would like to add anything to this discussion, but I think that that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, so I see we have Christian Klein with us this evening. Christian, is there anything that you would like to add before I turn it over to the board? I would thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Christian Klein, Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. So at the time of recodification, the Board of uh, the Board of Appeals actually did not have a set of written rules and regulations. Um, we did have rules and regulations as they relate to comprehensive permits, but not general reg rules and regulations. And so um, this, this uh, subsection A was maintained um, as was sort of the only set of rules and regulations that were available. The board has subsequently adopted rules and regulations that are posted on the board's website. And so we um, request that this subsection A be removed as it is now redundant. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's very clear and I'm certainly supportive of this. I'll move over to uh, Kim Lau to see if you have any questions for Christian Klein or for Jenny Ray. No, I have no uh, questions at this time. I am also supportive of this uh, uh, article. Great, thanks, Ken. Uh, Jean, any questions? Or I comments? have no questions. I also support this article. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, any questions? Um, nope, same, support it, no questions. Great, thank you. And uh, Steve, any questions or comments? Uh, no questions or comments, Madam Chair. Great, thank you very much. So at this time, uh, we'll go ahead and open this uh, discussion up to public comment. Any uh, member of the public who wishes to speak on this, uh, Article 32, Please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen and I'll call on you in the order that hands are raised. All right, seeing none, uh, we will end public comment for article 32. Um, and I'll just ask if any of the board members have any further comment before we move on to the next article. All right. Seeing none, we will move now on to Article 33, which is a zoning bylaw amendment uh, related to half stories. This was inserted by uh, the request of the Redevelopment Board, again, uh, after discussion with Christian Klein. So Jenny, I'll turn it over to you for any uh, discussion related to the department's memo. Certainly, thank you, Rachel. Um, again, here, this is, I'll be very brief, but I do think that there's a little more that perhaps Christian uh, Klein would like to add, and per, uh, perhaps Kelly Linema as well. Um, in brief, you know, this has been amended actually a couple of times at this point, but we still seem to have uh, some questions about the calculation based upon how you're measuring uh, the actual half story. And so we think that this, the amendment uh, perhaps as proposed or with some minor modifications, might be the best way in order to alleviate, eliminate actually this sort of discrepancy in the method being used of measuring um, this particular calculation. It has caused a lot of back and forth between um, the Department of Planning and Community Development and Inspectional Services and the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I think that it's, uh, it's definitely something worth uh, 
addressing through this amendment, but perhaps with some minor adjustments. Great, thank you, Jenny. Kelly, did you have anything um, that you would like to add before I turn this over to Christian Klein? Sure, I think just to clarify the, the particular part of the definition that's been a little bit confusing for staff um, is this measured from the underside of the roof framing to the finished floor below. Um, and the question is whether that refers to the finished floor below the actual finished flooring on the third level, or if it's the finished floor as in the, the second floor, um, which I think is interpreted in different ways by different, different departments and different boards. So this, this amendment seeks to clarify that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so Christian Klein, I'll uh, turn this over to you to see if you have um, any, uh, any background that you'd like to, to offer for the discussion tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian Klein, Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, so with the proposal here, there's two parts to it. Um, one is to get at, as, as um, Ms. Lanham had mentioned, trying to clarify exactly what we're referencing, um, not only in terms of the, the clear height of seven feet, but also what the half story is in relation to. Um, and so we're including language on that. But at the same time, we're also uh, there was an attempt made during recodification to have the definition section really really be about definitions and not have too much regulation involved and then shifting that regulatory language uh, to the main body of the, the zoning bylaw and so this is seeking to to do that by creating a section um, 5.3.23 on half story which takes um, sort of the regulatory portion out of the original definition, brings it here, but then also um, adds that the proposed area is to be measured relative to the gross floor area of the story next below, uh, excluding porches and decks. And that language is actually taken um, from the, the one of the diagrams that we had included as a part of recodification, but did not um, <clears throat> take the language directly into the bylaw. Great, thank you for that clarification. That's very helpful. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Ken for any questions or comments. Yeah, I do have a question on this one here. Uh, I remember a few years back, we voted on something similar to this and we voted so that uh, the, the height actually um, was, this, uh, so it was coordinated with the state um, height. Is this seven foot zero uh, the same height as is uh, stated uh, in uh, the state co uh, uh, state code? I'll turn that over to Jenny, but I believe yes, it was changed from seven foot three to seven foot zero, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct, Rachel. And uh, just to clarify what uh, Kelly said earlier, um, this height is taken from the underside of roof rafter the bottom of the roof rafter to um, the finished floor of the half story. That's correct, right? Kelly, I'll have you, um, I think he directed that question to, to you. I believe the interpretation of the, um, I, actually, Mike Tiampa can probably clarify better what how inspectional services interprets this. I'll okay. turn it over to uh, Mike Champa, the Director of Inspectional Services. Thank you. Yeah, Mike Champa, Director of Inspectional Services. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it's measured from the finished floor of the attic to the underside of the roof rafter. Okay. Uh, I'm also with that. Yeah, this, this makes sense to me. I have no other questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ken. And um, thank you, Mike, for that clarification as well. Um, we'll now go to Jean for any questions or comments. Yeah, I, I had um, an email exchange with Christian earlier today about this, which I forwarded to Jenny. I think this all makes sense, except that I think the entire thing is a definition. It's not how you apply a half story, but this is all about how you define a half story. So I would not include the 5.3.23. I would move the other pieces up to the um, definition. So um, the definition would basically read as follows. A sto half, story half, 
a story which is under a gable, hipped gambrel, or other sloped roof with a minimum slope of two to 12 or less than one half, the floor area has a height of seven feet or more. The height is determined from the underside of the roof structural framing to the top of the finished floor below. The floor area is measured relative to the gross floor area of the story next below, excluding porches and decks. So what I did by that is, is put it all into the definition, because I think what we're trying to do, and I think this is right, is have the definitions define things and the rest of the bylaw say, how do you apply those to certain things? So what I'm suggesting is all of these things really defines how you measure a half story. And the substantive part is not here at all. The substantive part is in the table for heights and FAR in the residential districts where they indicate which structures can be two and a half stories. So I think we don't need the 5.3.23. We just to need to move that part into the definition. And that would be my suggestion. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, I'll take comments from um, Melissa and Steve, and then we'll circle back. And I'd like to, to talk about the proposal to um, change the way that the, the main motion is, is worded and the um, definition is constructed. Um, so we'll go to Melissa next. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I don't really have any questions. I can see what Jean's saying with applying it more in the definition and combining it. And then um, kind of, yeah, I'm really just repositioning it. It's the same language, right, Jean? Yeah. Um, again, I just feel better when I do hear from my champa just because I know he's boots on the ground applying this. And I'm wondering through you, Rachel, if I can hear if this, again, is helpful. I just want to make sure these changes are helpful from a very practical application. Uh, Melissa, specifically about the proposal that Jean indicated in terms of putting this all in the definition as opposed to adding 5.3.23? Um, yeah, if he could share some color on what's better for his position. Uh, sure. Um, so I'll turn it over to Mike Champa to see if um, from the way that you currently work with um, applicants, if there is any concern with um, moving this all to the definition as Jean has um, expressed an interest in doing. Yeah, uh, Mike Champa, Director of Inspectional Services. Thank you. Um, I, no, I don't have any concern. Um, I, you know, I like the, I like the changes and, and I think it will clarify and I don't see any issue with moving it as, as Jean has proposed. Great, thank you for the clarification. Melissa, any other uh, questions for Inspector Champa or um, any, or Christian Klein? Uh, no, thank you to Christian for putting this forward and thank you um, for the response. That's good. Great, thank you, Melissa. I'll actually um, turn it over to Christian as well to see if um, you have any concerns with the, um, with the change to including this in the definition that, um, that Jean has proposed as well, since we've also asked the same of um, Inspector Champa. Well, thank you. Um, I don't have any any specific concerns one way or the other. Um, I would okay. just want to make sure that you know whatever we're doing, we're in keeping with the with the intent of the layout of the of the bylaw. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Steve Revelak for any questions or comments. Uh, so I have two comments. Uh, the first actually has to do with the picture, although it's for illustrative purposes only and is not part of the bylaw. Uh, under the the, the half story in this illustration, there's a little cross hatched sort of wavy area that indicates the area that is um, meets the definition of a half story. So there's a little box at the bottom uh, next to the text floor area where D is greater than or equal to seven feet. So that box should have the same cross hatching. It's, it's a key basically. Yep. Um, now, as far as the choice to do that, I actually like, I, um, with with respect to Mr. Benson, I do like the idea of moving it into a separate section. Um, I think that's consistent with some of the things that we've done during recodifications 
you know, the like the the definition of gross floor area and the rules for calculating gross floor area, for example. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's value in keeping the definitions uh, simple. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you very much. Um, Gene, did you have any uh, thoughts relative to Steve's proposal uh, that we treat this similar to the way that currently gross floor area is defined and then um, instructed for calculation? Sure, I mean, I think if, well, I think if we made a mistake with gross floor area, we can fix it next time. But I think with this, what, what clued me into this is the proposal which has just a little bit of part of the definition, the way the definition was sort of stripped out of a lot of the substance and then said, go look at 5.3.23. And then it just turned out to be the rest of the definition, which is, you know, here's how you determine whether something's a half story or not, which is a little bit different than gross floor area, by the way. So I thought it was much more appropriate to be all in the definition okay. because none of 5.3.23 tells you what to do with a half story. That's all in another part of the zoning bylaw altogether. So I think um, in keeping with the idea that definitions should be definitions, and this all defines how you determine what I have story is, I'd move this all to the definitions and we don't need 5.3.23 because if you get from there from the definitions then you don't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to know that half stories have to do with you know attics and things like that on residential. So I think the better practice is to move it all into the definition because that's what it is. It's defining how you determine a half story. Uh, thank you, Jean. Steve, any additional commentary? No, there's. Um, I, I I think I think Mr. Benson makes a good argument. I don't actually have very strong feelings um, one way or another and moving it to the definition would be fine with me. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ken, uh, do you have any comment uh, related to Gene's proposal to move this back into the, the, the definition, um, but in a more streamlined way in the way that he's proposing? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I can go either way and it looks like the, uh, the board's heading that way, so I'm, I, I can jump on board. Okay, great, thank you. Um, any other comments or questions before we turn this over to public comment? All right, uh, seeing none, I'll now open this up for uh, public comment. Any member of the public wishing to speak about Article 33, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of the screen. All right, seeing none, we will uh, close public comment on Article 33. And um, let's see, it sounds like there is a sentiment to support Gene's proposal to um, move the, uh, move the uh, clarification all into the definition with the wording that is, has been proposed. Um, I'll just run through the uh, board members and see if um, that is, in, in fact, the case, and if so, we'll um, make that change before we vote on uh, next Monday, starting with Ken. Yes. Uh, uh, Jean, obviously you obviously, proposed it. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, Melissa? Yes. Okay, and Steve? Yes. Okay, and I uh, support that as well. So why don't we go ahead and make that change and um, we'll have that uh, wording um, updated. And I also am supportive of Steve's proposed change. Jenny, if we can add that in as well, in terms of adding the, um, the hatching to the, um, to the uh, diagram, if, if that's possible as well. Great. All right, um, so at this time, we'll move to Article 37, which is a zoning bylaw amendment related to unsafe structures in terms of defining who may make the determination that a structure is unsafe. And I'll turn it over to uh, Jenny Rate for um, uh, any 
information that you'd like to add relative to the memo that was prepared? I don't have any specific additional information to add uh, other than what is already in the memo. Great. And Thank again, you, this, this did come from the Zoning Bylaw Working Group and Christian. Um, so observation about the need to make this uh, change. Great. And we Thank also you. had a conversation with Mike Champa about it. So I think that between the two of them, there might be additional um, information to add to this discussion. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, so Christian, I will uh, start with you for any additional information that you would like to um, add relative to this proposed zoning by law amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, again, Christian Klein, uh, Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. The reason for adding, for requesting that this be added is that there have been occasions in the past where a contractor has claimed that, you know, this this piece of structure was unsafe and so we just removed it. Um, and having done so without consultation with inspectional services. And so we just wanted to make sure that the bylaw was clear that that determination was at the, um, was at the discretion of inspectional services. Great, thank you, uh, Christian. Uh, so next I'll uh, turn it over to um, uh, Mike Champa to see if there is any um, additional um, commentary that you'd like to make relative to this proposal. Uh, no, I, I actually, I, I agree with the change and I, I agree with what Christian had to say. It has happened in the past and it is something that um, this will help reinforce um, to hopefully prevent from happening in the future. Great, thank you very much. I do have um, one question for you, if, if you don't mind. Um, it's very specific that it's determined to be unsafe by the Director of Inspectional Services. And my question for you is if um, that is um, your intent or if it's through the Inspectional Services Department, um, I just wanna make sure that again, we follow your recommendation. So I just wanted to um, to check on that with you to see if, if it was clear that it needs to be the director. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Mike Champa, Director of Inspectional Services. Yes, so um, obviously if I was, uh, it, it, it would ultimately be, um, would be left to the one decision to be made, but if I was, you know, it could be at the opinion of, of one of our local inspectors um, being on on site, but rather sure. than you know have a, too many people um, able to say so. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I will now uh, turn it over to members of the the board for any um, any uh, questions or commentary, and we'll start with Ken. Uh, thank you, Rachel. I had the same question you had. Um, it, it's just one is, is it uh, has to be authorized by the director or could be done by the um, a building inspector that's in charge of that district? Um, that's, uh, you know, so I was wondering if we could do a little looser commentary, unless Mike wants to put it all on his shoulders. I, I'd rather keep it a little more broader saying by unsafe by the uh, inspection with services and, and leave it at that not not, and not take the word director out unless mike feels strongly he wants to be part of every single one of those decisions that's my only question great thank you ken um so mike champa i'll you know just see if you would be amenable to uh changing this to be determined to be unsafe by the department of inspectional services or if there's another designation that's more specific um, that again, doesn't render you having to be responsible for every single one of those if, if there is an inspector on site um, looking for your opinion on that. Yeah. Uh, Mike Champa, Director of Inspectional Services. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think that makes sense. I think the original intent was that ultimately um, the decision would come back to me, but um, it, you know, if, if I, I think that it, it, it would be a, another inspector that would be making that determination at a lot of times. Um, so I, I would be I would be comfortable with it being just by inspectional services. Great. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Jean, I'll uh, ask you next if you have any uh, questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Ken, were, you, were there any additional questions that you had? No, that's the only change that I would like to put in there. Great, thank you. Jean, any uh, questions or comments? I'm fine with the change and I support this article. Great, thank you. Uh, Melissa, any questions or comments? Um, I'm fine with the change and I support it. And I, is it Chris that's bringing these forward? Christian Klein, yes. Christian, and thank you for bringing these forward and making it, you know, clear and easier for people to do their jobs, and you included, Christian. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, let's see, we'll go to Steve next for any questions or comments. Overall, I think this is a good article. Um, I would like to just ask about one potential piece of wordsmithing. Um, instead of by the director of inspectional services, perhaps by the director of inspectional services or their designee. Um, you know, I think that, you know, still has still, it's just, just another way of, I think it just as another way of phrasing it. Sure. All right. Um, so what I'd like to do is open this up for public comment, and then we'll circle back one more time on the, the wording uh, before we uh, move on from Article 37. So at uh, this time, I'll invite any member of the public wishing to speak on Article 37 to please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. I'll give a few seconds to see if there's anyone who wishes to speak on this article. All right, uh, seeing none, we will uh, close public comment for Article 37. And I'll just run through um, the board one more time to make sure that we are aligned on the, the wording before we get to our next meeting on April 4th. Um, and uh, we'll start with Steve's proposal of amending this to the Director of Inspectional Services or their designee. And we'll start with Ken. I'm okay with that change language as is, yes. Steve's right. language. Great, thank you. Jean? Yes, I'm fine with that amendment also. Okay, uh, Melissa? Yes, I'm fine with it. Great, uh, and Steve, obviously you proposed it and I'll just mm -hmm. circle back to Christian Klein to see if you had any concerns with the change. I do not, no, thank you. Okay, and I'll also circle back to um, Inspector Champa to see if you have any concerns with that final wording. No concerns, thank you. Great, thank you very much. All right, uh, so at this time, that brings us through all of our um, zoning articles for our public hearings for 2022 town meeting. So at this time, um, we will need to uh, vote to close the public hearings for 2022 town meeting, noting that um, our April 4th hearing will be for board discussion and uh, voting only. Um, so at this time, is there a motion to close the uh, public hearings for the 2022 annual town meeting? So motioned. Is there a second? I will second. second. Great. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote starting with Ken. Yes. Dean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I am a yes as well. All right, uh, so next, let's see. We are not gonna be able to move, I believe to the public hearing. I'm sorry, um, Christian, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, I, I just wanted to express my, uh, my appreciation to the board for undertaking the, the, the series of articles this evening and at the prior meeting um, on behalf of the Zoning Board of Appeals. I really appreciate it, thank you. Well, thank you. We really appreciate, again, the, the Zoning um, Board of Appeals taking the time to consider all of these and, and make some really good recommendations and changes. So thank you as well. Thank you. Uh, great. So uh, unfortunately, Jenny, I think we can't move to the next article because we probably don't have all of the, um, the petitioners here since it was advertised for 915. It, it has to start at 915, but yeah. we could move up items three and four. Right, so I was, uh, why don't we go ahead with uh, item number three then, if you wanted to 
um, speak to the uh, request for waiver of the special permit filing fee, article or agenda item number three. Yes, so um, I've only come to the board one other time uh, with regard to a request to reduce a filing fee. And that was as a result of something that was in a request for proposals by the town where we were changing the, uh, the full price of our filing fee for the hotel. Um, in this particular situation, we've had a request made by an applicant for a special permit um, to waive the fee in its entirety. Um, it is not something that is economically possible. Um, and unfortunately, I do not have the authority to waive that fee. So I need to bring it to you. Um, the redevelopment board does have enough money in its budget to cover the cost of the legal notice. I think you probably know this, but you know, we, we don't actually have revenue that comes into the redevelopment board account. We just have a budget. Um, the revenue goes back into the town's, uh, you know, the general fund. Um, so there's not necessarily a direct relationship between the payment of a filing fee and the cost of advertising for the legal notice. Um, but that is really the, the transaction that is happening. But we would have enough money to pay for that advertising notice. So I would like to request that the board waive the filing fee for, um, for this applicant. Um, and I, I, ideally, I would like it to remain anonymous. But if you have questions about it, this is one of our family daycare, uh, childcare rather, applicants. So you will be hearing the application at some point soon, depending upon the outcome of this conversation. Great, thank you, Jenny. So I'll, um, I'll uh, run through the, um, the board to see if anyone has any questions for uh, Jenny or any discussion that you'd like to have on, on this topic. And we'll start with Ken. Is this uh, family daycare a nonprofit? No, it is not a nonprofit organization. No, it is an individual uh, wishing to operate a family child care out of their home. And uh, was just unaware of the level of resources needed in order to be able to proceed. And the special permit was a new, a new item um, that was not anticipated, I believe, as another fee. And to be clear, that's a $500 filing fee. That's all I have for now, Rachel. I, I'll circle back. I want to see what, what the other board members think. Okay, thank you, Ken. Jean? You know, when, when we voted to waive the other, or part of the other filing fee, I don't, I think it was part, I'm not sure we waived the whole thing. It was, it was half of the fee, yeah. Okay. I felt that we were boxed in by the select board in what it did um, and we had to do it. Um, I don't know what gives us the authority to waive a fee. And I, I wonder if you can tell us what gives us the authority to waive a fee that's been set by the town. I'll turn that over to Jenny. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, these are these are fees that are administrative. They're not in a published bylaw. So I think that we would have the ability to waive those fees. And we actually changed the fees ourselves. Um, many years ago, we changed the fee to include the cost of new construction, which was actually the cost of that other fee as opposed to this one. So I do believe that we have the authority to waive fees or amend fees if we're if it's ever requested. And again, we've in the six years that I've been doing this work, I've only, this is the first time I've ever had anybody request for a fee waiver. So I think, you know, that demonstrates that probably we're not typically asking uh, applicants to pay very much. We're also doing the bulk of the work for the applicant, as opposed to the Conservation Commission, for example, just for a comparison, you know, the applicant actually does the legal notice themselves and pays for all of those costs outright you know, on their own, independent of the town. Um, so I think that this is a slightly different operation. And so perhaps this was not anticipated by this particular applicant. And I believe that their economic situation 
is um, one in which I think it's fair to make this request. And do you know how the size, what the size of the daycare will be? This is the six child daycare, six at home daycare. Six or fewer children. Yes. Yeah. And what, can you just review what the, what the $500 pays for? I mean, I think that it pays for the cost of the legal notice, um, mm -hmm. you know, to run the advertising for the legal notice. So right now we run our advertising in the Arlington Advocate, hoping that it continues to publish newspapers. Um, and the, right, well, still it does apparently. Um, so that's where we run the legal notice and it runs for two weeks and we have to pay the price of the, you know, that they charge, which is, quite high and actually the price of the advertising has gone up, which is why I've changed the budget year over year. Um, so it does pay for that, but again, it, it's not, we do not collect fees to then deposit into a, a redevelopment board account. It's a fee that goes into the general op the general operating fund for the town. Yeah. By the way, the, Arling the owner of the Arlington Advocate announced last week that it was being combined with the Winchester Star. So it's now, Two newspapers of probably six pages. Um, yeah, those those were my those were my only comments. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Melissa. <clears throat> um, in terms of staff, you know, I'm curious to hear staff's perspective on setting precedent. If we say yes on this, I know it's not one. You know, it's been a long time since you brought uh, a waiver before us, but um, I'm curious about setting precedent for anyone that, you know, for either this use or some challenges, you know, as presented by other applicants. That's one thing. And then I guess the other piece is I can make a little bit more sense of it if, you know, the use or the goal of this. Um, in particular, I guess this is childcare. Have we stated that, it, you know, somewhere in our master plan or somewhere that we've said that we are concerned about this use or we are in need of this use? Uh, so you'd like to direct those questions to Jenny? Okay. Um, so for the first question, I don't think that this sets some sort of precedent for other applicants at all. I think that this is an unusual circumstance and I'm treating it as such and I'm, they tend to be pretty reluctant to bring these types of requests back to the board and have had other types of requests like this in the past that I have, you know, decided on my own that I did not think it was appropriate to make any sort of request to the board. This one, however, I feel is one that is important and does not set some sort of precedent. And there's an economic challenge for the applicant. And I think that it is clear that we, but my, my recommendation is that the fee should be waived. Um, there, no, I don't think that there's something in our master plan that says something about promoting childcare specifically. I think we make very clear, however, that we want to support independent businesses and entrepreneurs and people who are wishing to create home businesses and, you know, economic development sort of broadly. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I think in terms of me, I'm supportive of waiving the fee. Thank you, Melissa. Steve? Um, one small question. This, this would be a special permit filing fee for just a use? I mean, we're not talking building a new building? For a use, yeah. Okay, so, so there, there is just by nature probably less review and staff time involved. I don't see a lot of re review involved in this or the other day, uh, family child care um, special permit application. No. No. Well, as a um, you know, as an extenuating circumstance for a sole proprietor who's trying to start a business, um, you know, I would I would be sympathetic to their request. Thank you, Steve. Um, I know that this is a uh, the removal of this um, special permit condition um, is something that we are going to be taking up at the special town meeting. Um, I think 
if we are to approve it, it would be helpful to identify that this is for um, specifically for this type of use and it's not something that we will readily entertain for um, other commercial um, commercial uh, businesses. Uh, so if there's a, a way that we can make that clear, um, I certainly take Jenny's advisement very seriously in terms of the um, economic hardship that this particular business owner is, is facing and specifically that it is a um, small family, family daycare. Um, but again, I would want to make sure that we're clear on um, what we will and won't entertain. And again, that, that this is something that we will be addressing again at um, special town meetings, since it is not something, it's something that has not been reg regulated, um, even though it is in uh, the, the bylaws in the past. Would you say that that's a fair assessment, Jenny? I think that's a fair assessment. I think the only, I would add uh, uh, only one minor thing, which is that perhaps the board can put into its rules and regulations something about economic hardship. You know, I think that that, I don't think that that means that has anything to do with use. I think that there could be other applicants who might face a similar challenge for a variety of reasons. Um, and I don't think we need to go into all the possibilities, but I think that it sure. maybe to have, to have some sort of rule about that in, or maybe to amend the rule related to our fee structure we can make a point about economic hardship requests and sort of the process that you wish to go through in the future. We just don't have one. So right. I'm doing, I'm, you know, I'm doing what I can to uh, facilitate this for this particular applicant who is clearly has an economic hardship. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, so I'll circle back to see if there are um, any other uh, questions or, or discussion, um, and then we will need to uh, vote on whether to waive the special permit filing fee for this particular applicant. Uh, so we'll go back to Ken. No, I have no questions. I, I think I could be supportive of this too. Great, thank you, Ken. Jean? Yeah, I will um, rely on um, Jenny's representations to us about the need to do this. And, and also I agree completely, we should add something to the fees part of our rules and regulations, which sets out some standard or criteria or something by which we can show how we do this and might do it again. Great, thank you, Jean. And thank you, Jenny, for that recommendation. Um, Melissa, any? additional discussion before we move to a vote? No. Great, thank you. Steve, any additional discussion before the vote? Uh, nothing further. Great. Uh, so at this time, is there a motion to approve the uh, requested waiver of special permit filing fee for economic hardship for the uh, applicant that Jenny's brought before us? So motioned. There a second? Second. We'll take a roll call vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. I am a yes as well. All right. So that uh, waiver has been approved. Thank you all, and and thank you for the conversation about it. We'll we'll circle back on the other uh, matter at a future date. After town meeting. Yes. All right. In June. In July. Right. <laughs> right. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so I think that the other uh, agenda item that we'd be able to um, take before uh, we pause for the um, for agenda item number two at the meeting minutes from February 28th, 2022. And I will um, go through the roll call to see if there are any uh, additions or corrections. And we'll start with Jean. I sent a number of uh, additions and corrections to um, Jenny and Kelly the other day and don't have any additional ones to add. Great, thank you, Jean. Uh, Steve, I saw that you sent some earlier today. Is there anything else that you? Uh, nothing beyond what I sent earlier. Okay, thank you. Uh, Melissa? 
Yeah. All right, Ken. Yes, I had one small change and I can't seem to find it now. Well, can I do one while you're looking? Sure. Okay. Uh, so on page two, uh, Jenny, uh, I think it's the, uh, if you stop right there, oh, go down a little bit, it's the second to last paragraph, where it says, Ms. Tentacolis said that he, it should be the MassWorks grant, cannot be lost. That's the only one I had. Take your time, Ken, we have 45 minutes until. Um. Let's notice I'm gonna have a mistake here. It's on page um, four out of five near the top. Four out of five. The, the Theria? Uh, yeah. Uh, I said, Ms. Lau asked, Island wants to be a bedroom community, or if Island wants, take the word does out or some of that. I, 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 was, I meant diverse more of a diverse uh, community with street activities and vendors. Just, I think that's what I had, I said, I'm not quite sure exactly what I said, but that's what I meant. All right. Does that work for you? Sure, it's close enough. Okay, great. Anything else, Ken? No. All right, uh, let's go ahead and uh, see if there is a, Motion to approve the February 28th, 2022 meeting minutes as amended. So motioned. Is there a second? Second. All right, we'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Dean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So the meeting minutes have been approved as amended. So uh, at this point, I think we'll, we'll need to um, pause and um, we'll need to- We could do open forum. I mean, you can move okay. that up if you wanted to. And again- Let's you know, do it. Another 20 minutes, potentially. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and do that. That would be fantastic. I think that's the last agenda item we'd be able to, to, to move through. Uh, but at this time, we'll go ahead and uh, open the meeting up uh, for open forum. So any member of the public who wishes to address the board will have up to three minutes to address the board. Please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. And we'll give a minute or two to see if anyone would like to address the board this evening. All right, seeing no one, we'll go ahead and close open forum. So that closes agenda item number five. So we will need to um, to to pause, uh, and uh, what we'll do is adjourn and return uh, back um, at nine fifteen for agenda item number two, the uh, docket number three six nine zero. So um, I think I need to take a do we need to take a motion to adjourn? So if I could hear a motion to adjourn until 9.15 uh, from the board. So motioned. Is there a second? Second. Uh, we'll take a vote starting with Ken. Yes. Dean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we will see everyone back here at uh, 9.15 for the environmental design review. Rachel, we just leave this logged on, right? Or do, or yeah, you we can stay logged on, just mute and stop your video. Yeah, and we can pause the recording. I'm gonna that put up, great. I'll put up. Thank <clears throat> you.
All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> Try that again. All right, no echo this time. Welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us after our brief hold between agenda items. Uh, so we'll now um, jump back in and return to agenda item number two, which is the uh, public hearing for docket number 3690, 34 Dudley Street. And uh, before we begin, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jenny Raitt and Kelly Linema from the Department of Planning and Community Development to run through anything that you would like to highlight regarding the, um, the, the really thorough memo that I appreciate that the Department of Planning and Community Development prepared for this docket. So Jenny, I'll hand it over to you. Hey, Rachel. Um, I will be brief. I know that the applicant and I think their whole team is here and they also have a presentation, so which I'm going to run through uh, when they're ready. So in, in our memo, you know, I, this is the first time that we're seeing an application that is applying the industrial use design, sort of the, the standards, the site design standards, um, and trying hard to find a way to incorporate um, you know, sort of different elements on what is currently a completely paved site. Um, the current site is an auto body use. There's, I think, a total of three structures on the property, one larger one and then two smaller uh, buildings. They would be taken down and what would be uh, put up in its place, in their place rather, would be a self-service storage facility. Um, that storage facility would be is proposed as a five story 58 foot tall 95,706 square foot building um, which would hold approximately 740 to 780 storage units and also have an office for staff um, it would be staffed uh, between specific business hours but also allow uh, customers who have storage units access between 6 a.m and 10 p.m. all every day of the week. Um, they are proposing a reduction in parking. Um, we used a standard uh, to look at the parking, which measured out how that they would need about uh, almost twice the amount of parking that they're actually wanting to put on site, which would include uh, their proposal is for four loading spaces and 11 parking spaces, uh, which would be provided on a surface parking lot. Um, and then also some very modest amount of bicycle parking spaces, both inside and outside, which they also would uh, need uh, a waiver for because they're reducing the amount that is required. Um, so this is a very unique proposal in that it is also adjacent to the Millbrook. Um, and in that it is uh, the back of the building is really what's looking at the brook. Um, they've already been to the Conservation Commission where they um, actually have received some excellent feedback and I believe incorporated a, a number of the things that were requested by the Conservation Commission, which is included in this memo. Um, so it, it appears that from a stormwater and sort of the, the ability to uh, look at the sort of open space on the site, uh, trees, mitigation, those are things that are being adequately handled on site um, to the best of their ability. Um, I think the, you know, the, the primary thing that I would point out here is that uh, the back of the building probably needs some work. Uh, that's, the, that's the side that I think probably needs the most work, but I think we also might talk about sort of how the front of the building interacts with the street. I do think that they've done uh, as much as they could at this point to try to find some sort of more human scale elements uh, to the building, but it probably could go a bit further. It is a pre fabricated metal building uh, completely. And I think that potentially if they change some of their materials that might add to a slightly different feeling overall. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that they do have a traffic study and I think that it probably uh, warrants taking a look at that more closely to get a better understanding of sort of the, the flow and the demand of this particular use. We only have one other self-service storage facility in the town. Um, so we don't have, you know, necessarily a, a lot of experience with the, this particular use, but it is actually along the same street. So um, there is some proximity to that other storage facility. Um, then lastly, um, 
you know, I, I don't think I'm going to run through every single one of these um, site designs. They are, of course, also asking for that exception to the maximum height. So it is important for you to review them because they're asking for that additional height. Um, and I think I'm going to pause and I'm going to see if Kelly, would you like to add anything or point any, uh, a couple of other things out and you can, I'll scroll for you before we let the applicant um, provide their presentation. I think um, I, you noted the that they're requesting the exemption to the height maximum. Um, this building is definitely taller than any other building along Dudley Street, and that is really as a function of the updated zoning. So um, this is the first application we've seen. It may not, probably will not be the last. Um, and so that's something to consider. Um, and also just, you know, in, in discussions with our environmental planner um, and conservation agent, you know, they are doing, uh, the Conservation Commission was fairly impressed with the work that they are doing in order to improve the site and improve its relationship to the Millbrook. Um, that is, I think the other thing is, as Jenny noted, is the, the parking reduction. They're seeking a parking reduction that's greater than what the board could probably allow. So there's a discussion that has to be had about parking. Um, and then just overall, I think, you know, they are checking the boxes on those various site design standards. Um, and that they are providing, so they have requested signage that is greater than the allowable signage, um, both in area and in number of signs. Um, a couple of these signs are allowed under, um, uh, the, because they're directional signs or um, providing incidental information, they're allowed. But I think it is important to note that the two wall signs are significantly larger than what's allowed in the zoning bylaw. Um, and then the additional freestanding free monument sign is illuminated right now, and that is uh, illuminated freestanding monument signs are not permitted in section six of the bylaw. So that would be another discussion. Um, I, th I think overall it's the sign area that the board may want to consider as part of its discussion. I think that is pretty much, I think that covers it. The existing structure is not historic um, and that they are demonstrating that the, the lead could, uh, the building could have a lead score. It could be lead platinum certified. So they're sort of, they're seeking the highest lead certification rating. That's it, Jenny. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, Rachel, if it's okay, then I'm going to see if, I know Bob and Essie is here and I believe the other team members. So if it's okay, unless there are questions for either one of us, we can turn it over to the applicant for their presentation. I think that would be great. And then we'll take questions for both the department and for the applicant at the same time. Um, so, Attorney Anessi, I see that you're here. Yes. You could introduce yourself and your um, colleagues who are here this evening, and yeah. um, we'll look forward to a 10 minute presentation. Thank you. Yeah, Robert Anessi for the applicant. And since Jenny and Kelly have essentially uh, stolen my presentation for the most part, there isn't an awful lot I have to say. Uh, I would like to introduce our team. Uh, and what you're going to, you're going to hear from Eric Gerard. Eric is going to talk about our site plan. Uh, Matt uh, uh, Ke uh, Keeley, Keesley is going to address the traffic report. Jan Bryan will be, uh, will give a short introduction with respect to the elevations. And you're going to hear from Pete Williams, who's the president of uh, Premier Storage Investors, because I think it is important that you know something about the company itself that is proposing to build the storage facility. Uh, I'm just gonna make a couple of comments. Uh, we're talking about an I zone. I know that there are residential homes in the I zone, but this is an industrial zone. And the, we, we don't have that many industrial zones uh, that basically are in, in private hands. We have the town yard, uh, we have the Myrak property, but that's now 40B. 
This is a prime industrial zone. And as Jenny Raitt has indicated in her memo, and I'm going to uh, plagiarize that a little bit, she has said that the master plan has essentially indicated that we should be trying to maximize the kind of building that is done in the industrial zone. That's exactly what we're trying to do with this project. Uh, I'm going to uh, be available for any questions that may come later on, but what I'd like to do is get right into the presentation at this point. And Eric, would you jump in? Eric, uh, I believe, is going to make a PowerPoint presentation with the aid of either Jenny or Kelly. Thank you, Bob. Uh, good evening. My name is Eric Gerard. I'm a civil engineer with VHB. Our headquarters are in uh, Watertown, Massachusetts. Um, so thank you very much for hearing our project tonight. Uh, we're really excited with the opportunity to come forward with a, a project that is really striving to meet the intent of um, the industrial zone, the new, the new regulations um, that have been set forth. Um, so as you can see, this is the, the cover sheet. You can go to the next, um, next page. Uh, next page, Bob already went through this. I'm um, just kind of the discussion points that we want to kind of hit on our current project status, the reviews, coordination. We've already you know, been to the Conservation Commission for our first hearing. Our next one's scheduled. It's either going to be the seventh or likely continued to the next. Um, go over the site conditions, the existing conditions, proposed project site improvements with the site, traffic, and architectural, and then obviously open it up for questions. Next, please. Um, so we have, we have met, we're meeting with, with the redevelopment board tonight, uh, planning department, we, we've coordinated um, with Jenny in the past, um, as we were getting the project off the ground, uh, went through a couple, you know, design changes during that, during that process. And then also, um, I'd coordinated a little bit with the engineering department, as we were getting in, more involved with the stormwater management, which is all, obviously a, a very important piece uh, to any redevelopment project. Uh, we are here seeking the, the special permit for use, as well as the, the waivers for the reduction in parking and the reduction in uh, the bicycle parking as well, um, in the Conservation Commission with the order of conditions. So this is a, a view of the existing site conditions. Um, as you can see, the, the site is primarily paved. It's a 0.78 acre parcel of land, uh, auto body repair shop. It's about 11,000, 12,000 square feet in total area out there. Um, very, very little open space. It is within the Millbrook resource areas. Um, as you can see, it's in pretty close proximity. We have the, the buffer zones that extend in with the 25 and the 50 foot, the 100 foot, and then essentially the entire sites within the 200 foot riverfront area. So we are in front of conservation uh, with the order of conditions with the notice of intent application. A portion of the project, um, adjacent to Millbrook is actually encroaching into town owned land. So we're, as part of this project, we're proposing to pull that um, encroachment out and fix up the rear slope and restabilize that. So that's part of our discussions with the, the Conservation Commission is, you know, the proper way to do that, um, getting the town involved and making sure that, you know, we do that appropriate and saving as, the existing vegetation as best as possible while stabilizing that slope. Um, just want to point out that the existing building also uh, doesn't conform to the current setbacks that are out there. Uh, it's, it, it's really it's on the property line and might actually be over it slightly. Um, so with the proposed project, we're um, going to be tightening that, that up and you know, conforming to um, the setbacks. Uh, next, please. So the proposed building, uh, it's a 95,700 square foot, five story self-storage uh, facility. We are proposing access off of Dudley Street and we are proposing to cl close one of the curb cuts that's currently out there to make, a, make it a little safer as far as site access goes uh, for people walking up and down that street as well. Site improvements include uh, 11 new parking spaces, which we are re requesting a reduction from the 96 that are required for an industrial building of this size. Um, similarly, with um, the bicycle parking, a reduction 
where it's required for 134 total bicycle parking spaces, where 57 would be short term, 77 long term, um, and we are proposing 11. We feel with this use, um, bicycle parking is not going to be really desired or used. Um, however, we do feel it is important to still provide it um, and meet, meet the intent as best we can. Uh, Matt Keeley will get a little bit more in depth with the, with the parking, how, how we come up with the numbers and how we can defend um, a use in a building of this size um, to require. We, we believe we are well over parked for this facility. Other, other site improvements that I would like to point out, uh, pedestrian amenities along the frontage, um, design standards are calling for some additional benches. So we're providing two benches, uh, a, a new sidewalk along the front, new access and pedestrian connectivity into the site. Um, a big component of the project is the landscape. We are reducing the overall uh, impervious area on the site as part of this redevelopment project. So that's both aid in, in stormwater management with a reduction of that where we're slowing down all the water, the amount of water that's coming off, um, as well as the ability to provide new landscaping and really enhance um, the site and add a little bit more green space within the Millbrook resource areas. We are providing four covered loading uh, spaces that we're showing there within interior to the building. Uh, those are essentially gonna be parking spaces as well, uh, but we are calling them loading because they are enclosed. And that's where the primary function of the building will happen. Most of the uh, vehicles arriving here will be just backing into that. That's the primary location where uh, people will be utilizing to enter into the building uh, to access the storage facility. Additionally, all the, the bicycle parking that we are proposing are, is either covered or enclosed. We have two uh, bike racks at the rear of the site that's underneath the building overhang. Uh, uh, within the covered storage area, there's gonna be an additional six spaces. And then the employee space will be dedicated, is gonna be a dedicated storage unit for employee use within the facility, uh, which will certainly be large enough uh, to, to, to house at least one bike. We are also providing an enclosed dumpster area at the rear of the parking facility um, to handle all the, it's a very low refuse generation waste generator. Um, persons visiting or utilizing the site, they, they're required to, whatever they bring in, they got to carry back out. So it's not a, a, a dumpster to be utilized by the tenants of the building, um, the people leasing the spaces. It's, it's more for just the employees. Um, at the facility. So I just uh, want to give you a time check. You have about a minute left. If you have um, a bit more in the presentation and you need another, you know, three or four minutes, that's fine. But um, again, right, I'll, we, did, I'll, we did get this ahead of time. So I think if, if, you know, we were able to run through it, if there are things you want to point out that would be helpful that perhaps weren't in, uh, in the presentation documents. Thanks. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, Moving forward, yep, utilities, uh, stormwater management, all mass DEP regs. I'll let Matt get into the um, the, uh, the traffic study because I feel like that's an important piece um, to go over. So I'll let Matt run through that. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, in the interest of time, I can just cover these things really briefly, just a, a few highlights from, from our traffic memo on the next slide. So in terms of trip generation, um, in our study, we, pro we uh, provided a table that compared the trip generation associated with the existing use uh, with the proposed use. And that was based on Institute of Transportation Engineers trip generation manual data. Um, and what you can see on that table on the right and is, is shown in the memo is that uh, the proposed use is uh, expected to generate uh, notably less traffic than the, the existing use. Um, Another thing we pro provided in the memo was a summary of some empirical data uh, that we've collected at other similar sites as part of other projects we've done with the proponent. Um, and that data actually shows that um, that empirical data is actually less than the ITE data for self-storage uses. Um, so again, just, just to summarize trip generation, we are expecting to be a, uh, the, the proposed project to be a decrease uh, compared to the existing use. In terms of parking, um, uh, we are providing 11 surface spaces and four loading docks. Again, we, we collected some parking data at, the, at those sites that we collected the traffic generation data for. 
and we saw a peak demand of eight uh, vehicles at those sites. So we feel that the 11 surface spaces and the four loading docks uh, are adequate um, for a site of this size. Um, as, far, as far as bicycle parking goes, as you can assume this type of use isn't exactly conducive to customers uh, biking to and from the site. Um, with it being a storage facility. Um, so that, that bicycle parking is really geared towards um, uh, accommodating pedestrian, uh, accommodating employees who uh, want to travel to and from the site without using a car. Um, and again, with 11 spaces provided for bikes, uh, we feel that's more than adequate for the use. And lastly, just related to the town of Arlington requirements, we have to provide uh, three transportation demand management measures. Uh, we reviewed all the, the different measures that are um, summarized in the regulations, um, and we chose the three that we thought were most applicable to the site. Um, the first is to pay a stipend to workers uh, who, uh, without cars and don't travel to and from the site with cars, um, provide a prefer preferential parking uh, for carpool vehicles, as well as providing covered um, bicycle parking and storage. Are you all set? Yep. Matt? Yep. All right. Jen? Jen, are you there? Jan Bryan? Yes, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is uh, Jan Bryan. I'm um, a principal in Michael Parker Studios, uh, and our office is located in uh, Mint Hill, North Carolina. Uh, I'll be very brief. I think the uh, building kind of stands for itself. Won't take too much time other than to indicate that uh, uh, based on the comment that uh, Ms. Rate has made, recommendations uh, certainly would be more than uh, willing uh, to discuss uh, any of those uh, particular items uh, with the board uh, and possibly leave that more toward uh, the time of questioning. I think certainly the uh, opportunity to uh, add additional uh, glass at the front uh, entrance uh, is uh, certainly reasonable. I think the addition of some masonry certainly across the front of the building uh, would be um, uh, uh, acceptable. Uh, and then certainly we can discuss uh, what methods we think might be best uh, to uh, address the rear and side portions that are visible from Millbrook side. Uh, so I won't take much more time than that. Uh, obviously the building uh, is primarily EFAS uh, and a pencil rib prefabricated metal, uh, five stories, 58 feet tall. I believe we're allowed 68 feet, 65 feet, I'm sorry, but uh, 58 feet is the tallest uh, parapet that we have. And uh, I will just leave it at that and certainly available for questions as we begin to discuss uh, what the board might like. To see. Can we see can we see images of the exterior of the building so that we can see what it looks like? There we go. Oh, there, there we go. You'll yeah. see right there the uh, the front uh, of the building um, where we've got um, the, the uh, entrance into the, the uh, office. Uh, and again, there's an opportunity to add some storefront additional if we need to. Uh, we've met our transparency with the 50% uh, glass that we have, uh, not including that uh, loading zone area that is obviously open for transportation uh, in and out of the site. Uh, you can see a site um, image there from the rear of the property that really wants uh, uh, the, the landscaping, the trees are in place, uh, full growth. Uh, the topmost portion of the building is what's going to be most visible. So certainly can discuss options. Uh, and recommendations that the board may have uh, to address uh, Ms. Rate's concerns on those. Uh, so I'll, uh, uh, if there, um, unless there's some specific question for me, I can certainly be available for questions as we get into that portion of the uh, presentation. Our, our last speaker is Pete Williams. Pete, can you jump in? Yes, sir. Uh, am I visible and, and heard? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank yes. you. Am I visible? I'm, I'm, I think I've got everything on. Yeah, uh, we, we can see you too. So welcome. Right, thank you, board. Uh, my name is Pete Williams. I am the president and principal of uh, Premier Storage Investors. Uh, our offices are located uh, at 530 Oak, Oak Court Drive, Suite 155 in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, 38117. Uh, I've been doing this. Uh, Self-storage is the only thing that I do do and our company does since 1989. Uh, I've acquired and developed over 300 properties in 35 states in my career. Uh, 
Premier Storage Investors uh, has been in existence in some form since 1997, which is uh, right after five years. Um, the, uh, the mandate and the mission of our company solely is to identify self-storage sites uh, in major metro metropolitan markets throughout the U.S. that are supply deficient and deprived. Um, candidly, uh, Arlington is, uh, is probably the most deprived that I've seen in the past several years. Uh, currently, you guys mentioned uh, having that one small self-storage facility uh, in, uh, in the market, uh, which provides, I don't know, probably not even one square feet per capita uh, whereas the, uh, the need, uh, in, in the U S as, as calculated by the industry, uh, trade, uh, uh, trade companies are, would be seven, seven square feet per capita. Uh, we are, that would extrapolate into probably a current demand in that marketplace for about 8,000 self-storage units. Uh, we are adding approximately 750, somewhere between 740 and 780, uh, and would estimate at this point, based on what we know of the market, which is generally a three mile radius, that that would, uh, be about 1,500 units, which certainly leaves, uh, if, even after we would build this self-storage facility, uh, would leave a deficiency of unmet need of 6,000 to 6,500 uh, self-storage units. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's quite simple uh, in that I think the, the presenters have done a great job in, in laying out what it is we're trying to do uh, specifically, but generally speaking, we're, we're trying to meet uh, a, uh, a need in that marketplace to uh, give, give the, your constituents and the people in that community an opportunity to, you know, have that space uh, that others, you know, in the community or in the area uh, do have. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Certainly available for questions on, you know, anything operationally or, or philosophically. Uh, we certainly said I've done this in 35 states and, you know, our desire is to be a great neighbor. Uh, we've worked with boards, uh, you know, throughout the country to, to solve uh, you know, the, the issues and, and the needs and uh, are certainly open and willing to, uh, to do that with, with you guys and the other, uh, other boards that we're working with right now uh, towards this project. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Thank Thanks, you Pete. very much. Appreciate it. <clears throat> All right. I think that's, that's our uh, presentation, Rachel. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so at this time, I'll turn it over to members of the board for uh, questions and thoughts that you'd like to share with the uh, applicants. So we'll um, take questions from the board, then we'll take public comment, and then we'll come back to the board for a, um, for a more thorough discussion. And um, just for any member of the board, uh, any visual that you'd like to, to see up, um, we'll just direct those requests to Jenny and to Kelly. So we'll start with Ken. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, if we can get to uh, a site plan, uh, Jenny, is that possible? Uh, right now, uh, I am supportive of this project, uh, but I do have a few comments that I like to, uh, or requests that I like to uh, request of the ownership here. Um, once we get to the site plan, uh, I noticed you have a six foot uh, wooden fence along one side of the property and it stops right at the corner by your, um, uh, 
right there. That's good enough. Uh, there's a there's a six foot fence that that lines the, um, um, all the way to that corner uh, where you have. Uh, let me see where it is. Load up a little bit. Right, right at the angle there. It stops right at the angle. Uh, I like to request that uh, the fencing continues along that angled uh, part of the property line uh, till it closes off the building. Just because all those cars that park there, their headlights are up high and it'll be um, shining right through the trees into the park, uh, or the play field, playground fields. So if you continue that fencing there, I, I would appreciate that. And that would, uh, that would uh, limit some of the, the lighting that would shine on the ballpark. And also, uh, I believe some of the trucks would be using that for the three-point turning into the loading dock. So th there's quite a bit of lighting, high and low, shining through uh, that edge there, along the angled edge there. Uh, that's one of them. Um, the other request is if you can go to one of the, um, uh, the renderings, Jenny, on view three. It's, a, it's the 3D ax, uh, asymmetric. It's, it's his view three on it. All right. Um, see, See that big white panel there? That's uh, right at the corner. You have to put some a little more articulation there. It's just one big white panel that doesn't seem. It seems kind of out of scale. Um, you have to introduce either some more uh, something to break down the scale a little bit more, or even put a silk screen up there with some sort of uh, design. I think uh, one of the letters came in. And they showed some examples of what all the parking garages did. That's a good idea. I, um, um, I would I'd be appreciative of that, of some sort of something to break down a scale. And that would be the first thing that you see. Along the edge there, where, the, where you have the grass that faces the, the driveway there. Um, the way it is right now, I, I see people going to be parking all over that grass and driving all over that grass because that's an industrial park to that little alleyway down there. If you can put some sort of shrubs right there along there that, so that uh, cars won't be driving on the grass on your property and making it a huge mess. You, you, it's just gonna get really ugly fast there. And you have a, a very nice building, landscape building. I wanna maintain it that way. So if you put some shrubs right along that, your property line, so cars won't be parking there, won't be driving over there, won't be, you know, so, so forth. Uh, the other one is, uh, I, I have a question. How many employees will there be in the in this place? Two. Two. And I'm going to request that you double your inside parking. Uh, you're asking. You're asking. you asking quite a, a quite a bit of a reduction in parking, uh, car parking. I think you got to give us at least two indoor bicycle parking, so that we we're really encouraging the workers to, to ride their bicycles there. Yeah, you're only providing one right now. So if you can just double that, I, I would appreciate that. Indoor bicycle parking, yeah. Indoor, yeah. not just not covered, yeah. indoors. I think yeah. we can make that happen. This is one of the list, Bob. Um, yeah. The other one is the, your blade sign. I don't like it. <laughs> if we can uh, eliminate that blade sign, I think your, your building is going to stand out. People will see it. You, you have presence on the street. I don't think that's required. And uh, the, the sign that you have that's above the entry there, it's way too big. It's above our uh, sign standard. I, I think if you cut that in half, I would be fine with that. The one you have up high, I, I think I'll be okay with that. I'll let the, let the rest of my board members think about that, but I think that one up high is fine. But the one that's above the entry there, it's just too big. And I like to get rid of the blade sign. Uh, I think those are all the limit, all the things I request, uh, those small changes. But generally, I'm supportive of the project and I like it. Thank you. Ken, just for, thank you, Ken. Just for clarification, by the blade side, were you referring to the monument sign? Correct. 
Okay, great. Thank you. That's all, all right. I have. Thank you very much. Uh, Jean, I'll move to you next. Thank you. Um, can you, Jenny, go to the page that has view number five on it, please? Thanks. Can, can you tell me where I'm standing in this view as I'm looking at the building? Eric? Where, I mean, if, if I were looking at this building standing where I'd be standing to look at this view, where would I be? You, you would, this is uh, Jan Bryan, you'd be at the, this is the back of the building facing Millbrook. So for instance, the- So would, would uh, I be, would I be, standing in Millbrook to have you, this view of the building? Yes, sir, you would. And I, I'm not sure if I can tell you exactly the distance um, away from the building we hear or are here, but yes, that, that's the direction that we're looking back at the building. And are those trees currently in existence that are shown in this view? Uh, I'm not sure. Eric, is that, um, I'm not sure how many of those are existing, how many of those we've added, Eric. Yeah, I don't think it's fully representative is, is the exact vegetation here and the slope. The slope isn't that, you know, well grassed. There's a lot of shrubs and, you know, some invasive species out there as well that kind of mingle in through some of that area. Um, so I think that the, the more intent of this was, yeah, to get the view of the back of the building from um, so, where so you're is, standing. Is this your intention that you replant it so it looks like this? Well, I, I would suggest that we've done uh, the best we can with this rendering program. Certainly, it's not meant to be an exact uh, replication of what's there. Uh, that's one reason you don't see the undergrowth and some of the shrubbery that's there existing. But uh, to the best of our ability, we've tried to uh, express um, the, the amount of coverage that we would expect to be there. You know, one, one of the concerns, which I'll just state now, is the need to do something with the facades. And it's a little hard for me to know exactly how bad this facade will look or how good it will look because you've put up a representation that's not representative of what one would see when one stands on the side of the brook and looks at this. So we're gonna to need to do better with this to get a feeling it for what this is about and what you're proposing to do here with the slope and with vegetation. Um, yeah, just, yeah, I don't need this uh, view anymore. Thanks, Jenny. Um, you know, this is going into where there's been auto repair places. Wherever there's auto repair places, there's a history of ground contamination. I wonder if you've done any site assessment of the site for any contamination. Jesse, uh, Morgan uh, from our team. Jesse, are you uh, available to, uh, to address this? Okay, doesn't sound uh, like Jesse. I could. Uh, I, 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 I know, I mean, the answer is yes, we it would be helpful if you've done a site assessment to look for contamination. I didn't see it, so it'd be very helpful. Okay, we have a process. we have All a right. phase we have a phase two that was done. You do? uh, okay. and we do, and we can certainly provide that. But we that, did have a do and a, a yeah. clean clean bill of health. Okay. If you will, for okay, that that would be that would be really helpful to see that to allay any concerns I would have about construction impacts on contamination. Absolutely, we'd be more As happy. well as the infiltration chambers you're gonna be putting in and you know ground contamination. So it'd be very helpful to see that. Thank you. Yes, um, sir. I, you probably saw the um, memorandum from the staff that your signage is um, not consistent with the town's sign requirements. And I would expect that uh, the signage is brought into 
consistency because I don't see any reason to give you any waiver from the sign requirements. So, you know, I think somebody can work with the staff of the um, department on how to get it in compliance. Um, I'm a little wondering about the hours. So as I understand it, it will be staffed from 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. But people, right. but people can access the site from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., so a much longer period of time, and seven days a week, not five. So explain to me, please, because I don't use one of these self-storage facilities. If I go during a time when you don't have staff there, how do I get in? Um, how do I use the facility? How do you assure there's no damage taking place when you don't have any staff there? Uh, Gene, if I could jump in just a bit on that, I'm not an expert on that, but we are going to have a code system for each of the uh, customers who will have access to the facility. We are going to have a large number of security cameras that are going to be surveilling the exterior of the building uh, at all times so that we will know what's going on. Uh, and true, we're not going to have an employee there uh, after uh, uh, you know, hours uh, Monday through Friday, but nevertheless, we're going to have a surveillance system there. So I think in, in answer to your question, uh, the customers are going to be able to have access because they will have a code to get into the building. And during the hours when the building's not open, the code won't work? Can I assume if I get there at 11 at night, my code won't work? That is correct. Yes, uh, Bob is correct. We, every, every tenant has a specific code. So we know we know whether the property is being staffed or is it if it's after uh, regular business hours when a tenant enters and when a tenant leaves the building. And as Bob said, well, there, our security package generally has 20 to 22 cameras uh, in it. So there's a number outside. There's a number of cameras inside as well. Uh, you know, we, it's it's security concerns are are not uh, are not uh, one of our biggest. Even though I know there's perception that you know in our industry that's like uh, you know what what happens. But and and there's very few people that use outside of regular business hours. But there are people from time to time that you know hey look I'm getting ready to go on a trip and I'm leaving at seven thirty in the morning and I need to stop by and get my beach gear. Uh, and you know they need access, or vice versa. They're coming home from the beach uh, at you know eight thirty, and they need to stop by and drop some things off. So you're, you're I think you've gotten the picture, and uh, you know certainly we can provide more detail on the security package uh, as needed. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. On on the bicycle parking, um, our general rule is the bicycle parking. Um, should be at the front or before the parking so that if somebody rides up on a bicycle, they can see where the bike racks are. Yours, however, are going to be at the very back of the facility. So I, for, you know, not the indoor ones, but the short-term ones. So I think there are a couple of options. One is you can figure out how to move them to the front or second, and maybe my colleagues will disagree with me, but it's possible perhaps to um, have some signage indicating um, where the bicycles are, because right now, if you ride up, how are you going to know where they are? I don't, unless you happen to have this graphic in front of you. So I think something needs to happen with the location of the short-term bicycle parking, or there need to be some wayfaring signs so people can find them. Um, uh, Ms. Ray mentioned 
the possible problem with trucks getting out onto Mass Ave because there's no traffic light at the intersection. I would say more if they have to make, you know, a left turn rather than a right turn. Can you comment on that? I think uh, I'll jump in on that again, Gene, if I could. Uh, I think at least with respect to the uh, kind of vehicles that we anticipate will be coming to and leaving from the site, uh, we anticipate that you might have small U-Hauls and that kind of a vehicle uh, uh, coming from and, and going to the site. Uh, I know there was a comment in uh, Jenny Wright's memo uh, about uh, heavier vehicles uh, heading down or coming around the corner down on Grove Street, which uh, admittedly is a tight turn. Uh, we don't anticipate that we're going to have those kind of vehicles. That's not the, the kind of experience that we have. These units, these storage units are relatively small. Uh, and they're not the kind of storage units where uh, you'd have a large truck coming up with a lot of goods, whether they be household goods or the like, to be stored in the unit. So, again, I, I don't. And in, in terms of having a traffic light up at Mass Ave, we, of course, don't have any control over that. Uh, in terms of that kind of traffic. But if you look at the traffic report, we're not talking about generating a lot of traffic coming to and going from the site. So I don't think that that is going to be a, a major problem uh, as far as the use is concerned, Gene. Yes, Gene. I will, I will add, as, as, a general, as a general rule in self-storage, 90% of, uh, of users are personal users. Uh, those personal users, uh, and this is broad, uh, in, in, a, in a, a, a facility like this with a demographic like we have, I expect it to be closer to 95% personal users. Uh, as Bob uh, uh, referred, it, those people... I would say way more than half. Uh, there's no way to, there's no way to, to, to call it. You, you just have to, it's, it's an art, you know, just having done this for 35 years, uh, probably half of, uh, it, not less than half to 75% of the people will just come in their personal vehicle. Uh, when people do need assistance with, you know, moving out of an apartment or, you know, helping, you know, some dislocation took place. Uh, uh, the things that drive our business, you know, he, he's correct that, you know, the what they'll do is go rent a small U-Haul and uh, come into the site. But, but even beyond that, the, the design and development of this site, we will, uh, you know, our managers talk to people and we tell them, you know, this site cannot take a large vehicle. We will not accept, <laughs> we will not accept large vehicles on the site. And that's a managerial thing. Certainly we have storage facilities throughout the country that, you know, they're wide open, big, you know, huge areas on four or five acres. And, you know, we communicate with those people. Hey, you know, we can accept you know, moving type trucks, but this just will not be the, the available at this storage uh, facility and it will be advertised and communicated the same way. So that's not, that's not our customer, I guess. So, if, so when uh, you say not a large truck, like what size large is too large? I'd say the largest truck you'll ever see on that site would be like a 24 foot uh, U-Haul truck. So, so we could probably, assuming we grant this permit, put a condition in limiting to no more than 24 foot trucks, I would think that would probably work. Um, let me see if I have any other questions. The other is about the facades and, and I, I'm not the facades expert on the redevelopment board, 
but I am very concerned about um, the view they provide from the park, from Millbrook, and you know maybe some of the other, well, some of my colleagues will talk about that. But I would be interested in seeing some alternatives to what you've got to soften the look. My, my final concern has to do with lighting. And Millbrook is a wildlife corridor. And I just wanna make sure there's not gonna be any lighting that uh, shines down onto Millbrook or the, the banks of Millbrook from the facility. So I'm wondering what you were thinking about for lighting for that in back of the building. Yeah, I can, I can hop in on that. Um, sure. And uh, conservation brought that up as well. So our, our, the lighting plan that we provided, there is one, uh, it was a 14 foot light pole back there and the spill, the, the spillover was slightly um, off the backside there. So we, I talked with the light, our lighting vendor and we're gonna shorten that down to a 12 foot pole. Uh, so that's gonna, that, that, that will pull the lighting back um, so it won't be spilling off down into the property. If you zoom into those numbers, um, most of those are zeros. So it's a little, um, as, it, as it goes down the, uh -huh. the slope. Um, okay. But we, we are gonna propose to shorten that to a 12 foot pole rather than the 14 foot. And we can provide better shielding along that edge um, on that light fixture so it doesn't spill over. And, and I just, want to make sure that you're not going to have any lighting light up this building in the evening because even though it's an industrial zone, there are residential properties. The Yeah, there, there, there won't be any sort of up lighting um, on that, that. That's that's not allowed. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Those are my questions. Thank you so much for the answers. Thank, Thank you. Uh, Melissa. Thank you, Rachel, um, and thanks to the applicant for you know bringing this forward. Um, although I want to kind of take a step back because I feel like I disagree a little bit with some of the um, staff comments in terms of getting to the special permit, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, I guess if we're talking about you know just the decision criteria around this and I was looking at 3.3.3B, um, essential and desirable for public convenience. Um, I understand from the applicant there's a need, um, but I also wanna look at the surrounding area. I know four, four miles down the road, there's another significant um, U-Haul storage space. There is the existing one. So I don't know if we've taken into account beyond the immediate boundaries is one thing. I think the other thing I wanted to think about and talk a little bit more about was 3.3.3F. And I'm thinking of this because although it's an industrial zone, our thinking around this from my understanding, the increase in the FAR and the intention in the industrial zone has been specifically to capture more emerging growth industries, um, I think we called out in our master plan, biotech, pharmaceutical, creative sectors. And I'm struggling to see how this use fits in line with a vision that we intend for this area um, so that it wouldn't be detrimental to a vision to enhance it over time. So I'm really struggling with this and seeing how it does meet that criteria. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, we can certainly return to that during our discussion portion. Um, any other questions for the applicant? Melissa, do you have any other questions for the applicant or, or just that um, one? No, I mean, if they could address that, those are, you know, questions not only for, you know, us as kind of a board staff to talk about, but the applicant is welcome to comment. I think the applicant, they, they did spend um, quite a bit of time talking about the, um, the way that they determined a, a need for the area. So um, I, don't, I don't think I'm gonna have them rehash that at this time, but we can certainly circle back to, um, circle back to it as a, as a board. Um, okay. So then the Any other questions? piece then, I guess, in terms of 
the applicant in terms of a commercial value for this property, you know, nearly 100,000 square feet of new commercial. Um, could you give me a comp for this property, a new comm uh, commercial self storage building here in town? Um, and could you compare it then for um, a commercial office and then compare it for a biotech R&D space? And if then you can include in the analysis, you know, an estimated personal property tax. I'm not sure what you're asking them to, to, to do. I'm looking, I'm looking at them asking them, Rachel, to see if we can try to get some comparisons because I'm really struggling to understand how this, you know, as much as it is a commercial property, I don't see it being as valuable as the intention that we have for the ind industrial zone. Okay, and I see what you're getting at. I don't think that's appropriate to ask them to create that analysis, but I think that that's something, like I said, again, that we can circle back to in terms of the discussion on the desirability um, when, when, we, uh, when we come back to discussion after all of the questions for the applicant. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Steve. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, over the weekend, I hopped on my bike, took a ride over, um, look, looked at the site as much as I could from, you know, the, the property aligned and also walked or w went through Wellington Park to look at the backside. And, you know, having done that and read the stormwater management plan, um, I think this is going to make a big improvement since the applicants are already working with the Conservation Commission. And this is in a 200, you know, the 200 foot riverfront boundary. Um, I'll just leave it at that and say, this seems like a welcome improvement. Um, now on to parking. Uh, with three, I know, I believe our bylaws requirement of 96 spaces is excessive for this use and this kind of space. Um, I do have a question about the estimate for 11. Was that gathered from examination of similar facilities or is that from in the ITE parking generation manual? I can probably uh, take that with, with Eric as well. Um, so the, the data that we can uh, collected at two other facilities um, had a range of uh, two spaces to um, eight spaces <clears throat> as far as peak demand goes. Um, I think uh, Eric could probably comment on how that laid out on the site and how they arrived at the 11. Um, but in terms of demand, um, we, were, we were definitely less than that from the empirical data. Mm -hmm. Yep, and as far as the site layout goes, with, with Fit and the other site features that we wanted to hit on, you know, we need the dumpster, transformer, uh, some of the extra space around the edges, we, we fit in the bioretention basin. So it's essentially what what kind of we, we could fit out there um, is what we what we placed out there. The I mean, my main question is, um, you know, the I agree. Like I said, I agree that 96 is is probably too many. But um, you know, I wanted to understand the you know the uh, sort of the case for 11. So uh, thank you for that. Um, signage. I tend to agree with Mr. Lau in that the uh, sign that's you know up on the fifth floor is probably okay, but I think 200 square feet on the second above the entrance is probably a bit much. Um, you know, after visiting this site, I went down the street to look at our other self storage facility. They do have a wall sign which uh, looks um, which is roughly about 66 square feet. Um, you know, something I th around that size I think might be more appropriate for the you know, the, uh, the front driveway entrance. Um, and Jenny, I'm wondering if we could look at, bring up sheets A103 through A105.
Would um would somebody remind me of the direction it might be in in this packet? I'm I'm in like the consolidated packet. Uh, I'm sorry. Keep, keep on going, Jenny. Keep on going. Rolling down. It's past it's this. Searching. Keep on going. Prob try maybe search for A1. Keep on going. You you you're getting close. <laughs> It's yeah, after the post. site plans. Yeah. It's after the site plan. Yeah, I'm just, oh, there it is. Okay, there, I, I skipped it. Did you want to see this one? Actually, uh, the, the so 101 is the first floor. I'd like yep. to see 103 and uh, okay. 104 and 105. Um, more on the, uh, what's on the left of the screen. Yeah, so the diagonal wall looks like it, this is a rear wall. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, you know, thinking about trying to think of uh, the facades and looking at the internal layout, and it, you know, it looks on in a number of cases there are, are units, you know, planned up against the exterior wall, but this the diagonal on the rear of the building seems to be, you know, um, you know, it, that doesn't seem to be the case. So, you know, I would suggest considering some windows or just windows or fenestra windows um, to break that up. It seems like it would fit in with your layout um, and would probably improve the appearance from the back. Uh, and that is all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, let's see. I just had a couple of um, comments to make before we then move on to, to, to public comment after any final questions on the board. Um, I just want to, again, agree with my colleagues about the need to comply with the um, existing signage uh, requirements. I also, um, Jenny, if you can either pull from the presentation or the rendering the, um, the axon that is looking, I think it's view one that's looking that's perfect. Um, so the other thing that I, I think is important, and I believe the department called this out in their in their memo, um, is to actually install the signage over the entrance rather than in this this area above the um, above the, the the drive aisle. I think they rightly pointed out that it is difficult to actually um, pull the entrance out of the facade, um, and whether again that's with awnings or looking at um, significantly increasing the amount of glazing there at that, that corner and making that its own volume. Um, I think that that's something that's important to, to look at. Um, I agree with Ken that I, I, I don't think reducing the parking down to 11 is something that I think is appropriate, nor quite frankly with the um, reduction, um, the way that the reduction opportunity to reduce your parking uh, 25%, uh, down to 25%, um, I, I, I'm, I don't believe that there's um, a real reason for us to, to go below that 25% that, that I think has been demonstrated. Um, I do have no issue um, reducing the, the bike parking um, because again, I, I, I believe that most people will come here just due to the nature of what they're dropping off in vehicles. But to Jean's point, I think we should try and encourage the two employees um, by increasing the, the interior uh, bike parking for the space. Um, the other item again that I'll, I'll just reiterate that I think is really important to look at is the articulation of all of the facades. Um, I don't think that the Full metal panel cladding is um, necessarily the most appropriate for, for this building in the neighborhood. Um, and I also agree with Ken that the, um, the scale of that first um, EFIS area um, just on the other side of the, the right side of the building here that we're looking at is definitely something that's out of scale and needs to be looked at. Um, and I and again, I just think that the cladding over overall, looking at some more masonry, looking at a way to create um, some more some more rhythm, and um, whether it's to cap the building or in in some other way um, break down that just the enormous visual scale um, is is something that's very necessary. Uh, so I'll just run through and see if there are any other questions. 
um, from the board or comments before we move into public comments, starting with Ken. Um, yeah, I'm a little um, concerned where uh, Melissa was getting at, where she had trouble with, the, uh, with this uh, project. Um, I kind of agree with Jenny saying this is appropriate for this area. This is an industrial area. And uh, I'm, not, I'm hoping we're not going to go pick and choose what we want for buildings. That's just not going to happen. Um, so if that's an issue, I think we should discuss that much more because I, I hate to see this uh, being turned down piece because of, uh, of that. Uh, thanks, Ken. I, I agree. I, what I'd like to do again is to move through questions, and then that will definitely be the first topic that we um, turn to as a board following the public comment, if that works for you. Okay, great. Thanks. Jean? Hey, just one thing I forgot to mention, a question. Um, the roof has to be solar ready, and I'm just wondering why you won't just put solar on the roof. As, as part of this project. You know, Bob, I'll ask you, you to answer that. You had two or three options. And to me, you chose the worst option. And to me, the option should be solar on the roof. So I'm just wondering why you wouldn't do that. Uh, I, this is uh, Jan Brown. We, we do have um, um, the roof set for, uh, to accept solar panels. And solar ready, but I'd like you to actually commit to put solar on the roof, not just solar ready. Well, not, um, hey, hey, Jean, can, can I address that, uh, uh, Jan? I mean, from, uh, the, the, from the business standpoint in that regard, uh, many times that has to do with the programs that are available. I mean, we, we are not in the solar panel business we have we have uh at times when when there's a program available uh done solar panels with a company that is doing that but many times your your state and local municipalities kind of come in and out of those programs so the reason we make it solar ready is so when when the program is available and out there we can we can respond to it that's great the, because we have in the state some of the best solar programs so i would really encourage uh attorney Anesse to maybe talk to the town's energy manager who can connect you up with those programs because it sounds like a, a, a win for you oh yeah they're, they're gonna be so uh, yeah so let's Put that on the list of things that will happen. That's great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gene. I yes. have that on my list to follow up with. Yep. That, that was it. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, Melissa, any other questions um, for the applicant before we move to public comment? Um, no, not at this time. Great. Thanks. Steve? I'll, uh, I will hold until after the public comment period, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you, Steve. All right, uh, so at this time, I'd like to uh, open the discussion up to uh, public comment. If you would wish to uh, speak to the board uh, about this, uh, this uh, docket, or if you have any questions um, that we will collect and then address to the applicant, please raise your, use the raise hand function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you'll have up to three minutes for your comments. Please introduce yourself by your first, last name, and address. And we will start with uh, Winnell Evans. Oh, you're on mute. How's that? Perfect, uh, thank Winnell, you. Okay, Winnell Evans, Orchard Place, thank you. Um, I My only comment is it seems like the facade has drawn an awful lot of concern tonight. And I wanted to make sure that all the board members and the applicant had seen the examples of facade treatments that I sent in to correspondents. Is it, is it possible for everyone to see those now? Um, Jenny, I'm, I don't believe that we can pull those up now, but we all, Gene is nodding his head and I know that I saw them. We all 
did receive both your email as well as those were posted on online. And actually Gene referenced those to the applicant when he was making suggestions for how they might treat the facade. Okay, it would just, it would oh, be- great, Jenny can pull oh, it up, perfect. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jenny. This is, um, as I mentioned, uh, for, the, for the applicants who may not be familiar with the Boston area, this is a parking garage on Route 2 um, that has used uh, this screening, which I believe is metal. But if you scroll down below this shot, you will see the two and, and even further, there are two more examples, which are um, tensile fabric. They're, they're not metal. And the, um, the great benefit of these is that pretty much anything can go on them. So particularly from the, the park, when you are looking at the rear facade of the building, to have something like this, a pattern of trees or plantings, um, could really do a lot to soften the impact of that rear facade and might even be appropriate on the sides of the building. So I just wanted to make sure that the applicant had seen this. Thank you. Great, thank you. Excellent suggestions. Uh, the next speaker will be Christian Klein. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Christian Klein, 54 Newport Street. Um, had a couple of questions. Um, one, so there was a, on the exterior views of the building, it appears that the, the rain leaders are run on the outside of the building. Um, and if that's the case, um, if they could be you know, run interior, it would be one less uh, thing on the facade. But it also appears that they're about four feet down from the top of the building, which implies that there's a huge parapet, um, which really has, was gonna interfere with the solar use on the roof and really serves no purpose except to make the building taller than it needs to be. Um, I agree with all the discussion about the parking. Um, you know, I think that the going down as far as 11 spaces is way too small, especially in the Boston market. As we all know, Boston moves on September 1st. Uh, we do not have an even moving season. And so there's a big spike that comes in September 1. And I'd be very concerned about the, uh, the spike in traffic um, that would be coming to this area specifically around September 1st. And um, my, my last, question has to do with the site drainage and the ability to go to five floors. So uh, their site plan seems to indicate that on the west side of the building, there's a series of drains that run um, along the side of the building and then enter into an existing uh, outfall to Mill Brook. And the, the uh, ordinance in 562D7 bullet three requires the retention and treatment of all stormwater on site and it appears that this site may not actually meet that criteria. And it's one of the requirements for going to five floors. And so I'm, I'm concerned that maintaining that existing outfall to Mill Street and the, the need to do that because there's so much impervious area um, does not actually qualify them for five floors. And so I would, those are my comments. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and I've captured some of those questions and we will um, ask the applicant to address those uh, as we, get through public comments. So thank you. Thank you. For the questions. Uh, let's see, the next uh, speaker will be Thomas Falwell. Good evening, uh, Thomas Falwell. I represent the uh, Director Butter at 26 uh, Studley Street, uh, Centennial Realty Trust. I filed earlier today uh, with the board memorandum in opposition and which raises a number of questions. I hope the board has have, will have if they have not already had the opportunity to review it. I won't rehash that other than to have make one comment with respect to the parking uh, diminution. Um, I, I don't think under any set of circumstances that you can go lower than the 25% because the reduction, the provision in the bylaw that allows a reduction below that as I point out, my memorandum applies to business zones entirely. So 25% uh, would be the absolute minimum. Um, I think it's, this has to be studied as, uh, as was just mentioned, um, the, the vehicle trips, I, we, I, I would recommend as I did, I, I would say I, I'm a former member and chairman of, the, of this board back long before either Bob Manessi and I would like to remember. And, um, we would always require in cases like this, a peer analysis of the traffic, traffic and the parking. 
who have taken some look at it, um, I noticed that there isn't, doesn't seem to be any traffic data for, uh, for Waltham at all. Um, um, the, the, and it's also important to note that this, the facilities that they cite as uh, comparables or traffic wise, one's on Route 60 and uh, two of them are on Route 60 in Malden and the other is on Bear Hill Road in Waltham, which is substantially different in terms of the ability to traffic handle traffic than uh, Dudley Street, which uh, is, is and has always been uh, quite congested uh, from a traffic standpoint with parking on both sides of the street. Uh, I have a series of other questions which I won't uh, put in writing and submit that based upon some of the comments I've heard tonight. Uh, one question I did have though was, uh, have they raised the rear elevation of the, from this present, uh, from this present elevation um, is, is that proposal to raise that elevation uh, and is that reflected in the total of the total building height? Uh, thank you. I've noted the question and we'll add that to the questions for the applicant. Okay. Um, as I say, the applicant, um, the applicants uh, traffic counts, they happen to choose um, April and May, which are by their own standards, the lightest months of the year and during the pandemic. Uh, if you look at their August and September figures, they're several times higher than that. So I think this cries out for an actual peer analysis of their, their information uh, done uh, at the expense of the applicant. Um, I'd also think it would be important to know, um, and perhaps the, the staff can uh, do some uh, digging on that as to what's the average number of parking spaces that are actually required for these facilities in the greater Boston uh, market area. Um, uh, and thank you, you're, you're actually at time. So okay. thank you. I, I will submit for other questions later. Thank you. I appreciate it, thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I have three comments, uh, two regarding parking. First, there's a small problem with the single HP placard space shown located in the far rear of the lot. This is contrary to federal and state regulations, which require that it be located on the shortest accessible route to the entrance. Uh, my second point in parking has been made by others. Uh, the board has the ability to reduce parking to 25% but not the 90% that the applicant is asking for. Um, and I wanted to talk about why this matters. This building is likely to remain here for 50 to 100 years. In the not so distant future, it could be reused for another purpose, perhaps for life sciences research or some other emerging growth facility offering good paying jobs. But if there are mere 11 parking spaces a future board will have to deny the permit. We're gonna be locked in with this. My other point had to do with the solar exposure. This building is a lot taller than any uh, others I, in the neighborhood. Don, I, I was very clear at the start of this meeting that you cannot um, share, share material in your background. I can't Thank have you. a background? You can't share material, which is what you just switched to. This was not the background you started with. So please switch to the background that you had before. Thank you. I don't understand why you don't want information, but in any case, this building's a lot taller and the shadows that were shown in the presentation package are not at all representative of reality. Unfortunately, there happen to be four two family homes and two single family houses falling within these shadows, which I could show you if you gave me permission. Their potential for installing future solar panels is going to be taken away by this project. But under the environmental design review, this board could take this under consideration and limit the height of the proposed building. And I refer you to section 3.4.5, I'm sorry, 3.4.4 item K, which calls for minimizing an adverse impact on light of the immediate environment. And if any 
board member happens to be interested in the details of this, I'd be glad to discuss it with them and send them the materials. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I've got a number of serial questions that sort of build in each other. So I'll just uh, ask them and, and hopefully the answers will come sort of, sort of serially as well. Um, I'm wondering, uh, and I believe I, I missed this. I believe the CEO spoke about how many years that this, uh, this business had, how, how many years have they been in business doing this? Um, I, I thought it might be eight years, but I'm not sure if that's, if I heard correctly. Um, and this is the investor group I'm talking about in Tennessee. Um, how many years have been in business? And the second question is how many uh, properties have been purchased for self-storage uh, over the course of those eight or whatever years it is? And the third question is of those purchases, how many does the investor group still own? What happened to the properties that were purchased were self-storage, did they stay within the portfolio of the company or were they sold for other purposes? Or, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get a feel for the amount of properties like this that, that have passed through this investor group and, and what happened to those properties. Um, and my, in terms of the fact that this, I, I believe they said it was going to be staffed sort of like a eight to five time frame with one or two employees and then is a self-service area until 10 p.m. at night, seven days a week. I'm a little confused about how that all works because once the staff leaves and the people who are renting can come, um, there's, there's really no control on size of truck or, or what happens. And once, once someone gets in at, oh, let's say 9.30 p.m. and has their truck and are doing whatever they're doing, who forces them to leave at 10 o'clock? Why could they not continue to, as long as they wanted to uh, continue to do whatever they were doing, be it just loading or unloading or something else in a self-storage unit, which is unpoliced at that time, except by camera. Uh, is there any ability to state what can and cannot be stored in such a facility? Um, I, I don't know how that works, but I'm a little fearful that with housing there, right there, uh, that, uh, you know, dangerous, chem let's say gasoline, I don't know, dangerous chemicals or something. Is that potentially an issue? Also, the 24-foot truck idea, I know that that is the expected limit, but with a number of uh, storage units that are 10 by 20 or 10 by 30, I'm not sure you can limit it. And I don't know how on a street the size of Dudley Street, which is a small street with cars parked on both sides, trucks can't really easily get down it. And I just don't know how this is going to work with all the traffic, particularly in the time period that uh, Mr. Revelak pointed out in September, which is, is quite busy. Uh, also, dumpster trips, there's gonna be significant dumpster trips because people throw stuff away in storage and the dumpster trucks have to be of a certain size. And how often is that going to happen? Is it gonna happen in the correct hours? that uh, doesn't disturb the rest of the neighborhood. And finally, my question would be, uh, in terms of uh, uh, this phase two uh, study of soils, which was, um, that was mentioned earlier by uh, Mr. Benson, um, I, I don't know what that is. I'm not an expert, but I would hope that that study covers the entire site, not just parts of the site, because this is a problematic Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other members of the public looking to uh, ask questions of the applicant or speak this evening? All right, so seeing none, we will close public comment and uh, move back to discussion. A couple uh, questions which I'd like to address to the applicant and Attorney Nessie, I um, ask that you uh, field these or ask your um, colleagues to, to reply as um, expeditiously as possible as we try and get through all of these before discussion. Um, let's see, the first is the question about uh, the rain leaders 
on the on the building? Is that something that you can look at moving into the interior? Eric? I guess I, I'd, I'd like Jan to weigh in on that because that's more of an architectural feature and how that um, would want to come in. From an ownership perspective, it's not it's not our preference at all. It, it can the there's two things our people ask of us uh, that rent from us. They ask that when they uh, come back to get their stuff, that it be there, number one, <laughs> so we keep it safe. And number two is, is that it be dry. And the, uh, the likelihood for an issue uh, is much more likely uh, if you have interior roof drains than if you keep the water on the outside of the building. So, so what I, what I, okay, I, I understand. So what I would ask then is that as we look at the, um, as, at the facades, that they be much more integrated, if not uh, integrated within the building, that they be integrated within the design of the facade. Uh, so, um, so the next question we have um, was a question about drainage off of the site and whether or not we are actually meeting the criteria for the increased FAR um, with the outfall to Mill Street. Yep, so the drainage along the, um, the side of the building there, they're primarily area drains to pick up um, the, the landscaped area on the backside. So no site impervious area is planned to be collected in there. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that that wasn't puddling up against the, the building the way the grading worked out. So we are proposing that um, to, go, to go direct out. The intent along the entire for the for the stormwater system was to reduce with the redevelopment um, the the future ten year storm to be below the existing two year storm. Uh, in discussions with the with the city uh, the town engineer, kind of walking through some of the stormwater pieces and, and the intent of the regulations to to best meet that and, and significantly reducing um, anything going out towards Dudley Street, which is. Um, one of the primary goals um, with, with MS4 is to kind of keep, keep the stuff on site and utilize, um, you know, existing outlets towards resource areas rather than sending it into a, a, a municipal system that could cause, you know, surcharging and issues um, within the municipal network further downstream. Great, thank you. Um, there may be some more questions, follow-up questions, I think, to, to that from the, from the board. Um, and I think you you answered some of the uh, operational questions earlier. Um, some of the questions around limitations on storage, um, I think, would be good to to answer in terms of. Um, I'm I'm assuming that there are materials restrictions, but if you can elaborate on what, if any, restrictions exist, uh, that would be helpful. Yes, uh, each each tenant signs a month-to-month uh, -month lease that has a rather extensive list of uh, restricted items to, that would be stored that they sign, walk in, and they're in front of a camera, and we have their IDs, and, you know, candidly, we our manager patrols the sites when people are moving in and takes some bottles of water and says, Hey, how you guys doing? And kind of looks over people's shoulder, not in a nasty way, but just in a, in a policing manner. That's what they're taught to do uh, whenever uh, folks are moving in. So yes, we do police it. And you know what? We do have a, uh, our, our leases are month to month. And I said before, you know, we do have cameras, we have a system, we know when people come in, we know when people leave. If people, if we ever have an instance and and uh, that somebody wants to stay over at night, we find it out real quickly and we address it. Uh, you know, actually much more efficiently than somebody who rents a 1500 square foot retail uh, bay uh, that there is absolutely no uh, policing of and the person could live there if they wanted to it's not the case in our building we the security we 
focus on the cameras. We know, like I said, we know somebody comes in, if they don't leave, we we're, we have that knowledge. <clears throat> My understanding is too, with the access codes, it's, that's also how you restrict um, access Absolutely. of renters for after hours, correct? <laughs> Each each renter has a unique code, so it's not like one code that could just be passed around town. And they make it up themselves. They do it just like you do a password for your everything that you have. Uh, that's the that's the process. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, um, so at this point, um, I'd like to turn it back to the the board for some discussion. Um, and I think um, first we should go ahead and address some of the um, concerns that um, Melissa identified. Um, I'm, I personally um, am supportive of this use. I think that there's some work to be done on the uh, facade and some of the, the, the signage um, as well as the, the parking. But um, I see given the um, the sections that were cited, um, no, no reason to oppose this project from, from that round, but I'm interested in what my other colleagues think, and I'll start with Ken. I agree with Rachel. I, I'm supportive of this project and the fact that I think it's appropriate and I think it is beneficial. Uh, and I don't want to be saying that we want something else there I do have one follow-up question. Uh, if I'm changing subject a little bit, Rachel, is that okay? Um, I wonder, Ken, if you if you wouldn't mind, if we could. I I, I just want to make sure that we're in a, alignment, or or not, or have a discussion about that. Um, just about the suitability of the project, if if you don't mind. Yeah, no. Okay. And then, great. I, then I, I've said all I want as far as. Okay, and I'll come back to you as soon as we we uh, run through this topic quickly. Okay. Uh, Gene, um, your thoughts on the suitability of the project? I wonder if Melissa wants to say anything more about it before I comment and before Steve comments. So, uh, sure, Melissa, uh, did you want to elaborate on the concerns that you had shared earlier? Um, I mean, I think it kind of summed them up. I think I'm a little concerned that you know we haven't taken into the broader context context of you know this use and if it's truly kind of you know needed we haven't kind of done analysis you know more regionally i think we have to take that into consideration um i just think we have you know precious limited industrial space um if you know my understanding with the rezoning and the intention to enhance the industrial area was not for kind of low value commercial space kind of built to the lot lines, but rather, you know, places that offer jobs, create places that create vitality that might fall into a light industrial use. Um, and so when you look at the long term intention and character of this, I don't see this fitting in. And I don't see this setting a tone or being a catalyst project for the area. Okay. Thank you again, yeah, thanks to Melissa for elaborating. So I, I should start by saying that, yes, I am disappointed that this is the first proposal that's come in since we changed the industrial zoning. We had hoped for a lot more and uh, more in terms of things that would be catalysts for better development, um, projects that would employ many more people, um, things that might be more cutting edge than a self-storage facility. So that's all really disappointing. Um, and on the other hand, you know, self-storage facility is an allowable use in this zone with a special permit. Um, and I think we should get rid of that when we go to town meeting next time, because I think one of these 
is going to be enough, if not too many. But I, I don't see enough, although I agree with Melissa, Melissa, I just don't see enough to put me on your side of the line about this. I think it falls on the side of the line as being something that we could issue a special permit for, assuming they meet the other issues that we've set out and will be setting out. So that's my thought about it. Thank you, James. Steve. Yeah, I've um I was on the zoning recodification working group and um you know while we were working on these proposals. And one of the sort of things that we went back and forth a lot about was um, buildings and uses versus traffic. So I would personally, I love the thought of seeing three to 500,000 square feet of class A office space in our industrial district. To me, that would just be wonderful until you realize that, you know, that's uh, anywhere from a thousand to maybe 1300 people who would have to commute in and out each day. So, you know, where Waltham has Route 20, has Route 128, Lexington's Industrial Strip has Route 2, Cambridge has a green and the red line, Arlington's got Mass Ave. And so one of the things that we tried to accommodate when coming up with the uses were low impact, um, you know, lower traffic impact uses, um, like you know, self storage, self storage facility is something we actually added later in the game because, hey, it's, you know, they don't take, there's, they don't have a lot of activity, they don't generate a lot of traffic most of the year. And, um, you know, there's, we only have one of them in town. Now, the one in town we have, this isn't exactly a comp, but the assessed value of it is, it's a 10,800 square foot facility. Uh, the building is assessed at about $70 per square foot. So if you were to carry that assessed value over to this 95,700 square foot building, it, it is actually a fairly nice bump in new growth. Um, you know, one of the, I, I agree that something more transformative might be nice, but um, we've got a history, you know, a, a his, we, Due to, due to various aspects of the town's history, that's, I, I think that's going to be very difficult to do. Um, you know, towards the close of the, um, of the, you know, project of coming up with the industrial zoning changes, our consultant asked, you know, what would success look like to you? And my answer was one to two built parcels being redeveloped in the next five to 10 years. So the fact that we have something after one is, is actually, um, you know, is kind of a pleasant surprise. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Rachel, may I comment to that? Please go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just you know, not to belabor this, but like if we're part of where this, I think the intention in terms of commercial value is also just something not to get lost is also the personal property tax, which goes into, you know, the guts and the values that are also inside buildings. So there might be, you know, there's the shell of the building, there's a value of the outside building and the inside building. Um, and, you know, from my experience, you know, labs, you know, in new lab buildings, um, they're, you know, three to four times higher than even what you just said, Steve. So, I mean, yes, it's an increase. Yes, it'd be, you know, an increase from what exists there. Um, I don't think it, you know, kind of holds the intention of what we were trying to get there. Um, and, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't familiar. I did reach out to Jean a little bit just to figure out, like, did we, what was, you know, what was that, um, the FAR? Because, you know, we, we included a density bonus, but we don't want to allow for the traffic. So, I mean, that that is a little bit incongruent to me and I feel like um you know if that is a thing we need to go back and revisit these uses and and because if I was looking at redeveloping a space and we were looking at that um I think we'd have to you know hard pressed to do you know an FAR of three for you know storage 
I, I just don't understand how people are reconciling that, um, you know, moving forward. I'm, I'm really struggling with it. And again, I get it. It's an investment and it's an enhancement, but we're also right on the edge of Millbrook or Millbrook. And so what I also have seen lately and it's really about these commercial buildings that have come in and really use the natural resources and the natural kind of assets to enhance place and to, you know, contribute to that activation. So I also see this as a loss in terms of turning our back onto the Mill Brook pretty much with this project. Um, whereas if it was happened to be a commercial, maybe we would be able to activate it and interface with that, you know, public natural asset could be improved but here it's nothing but you know it's back turned to it so i you know I, from the applicant's perspective i'm sorry i'm going on a little different you know, component of this it's a little higher level but um i'm more i'm newer to the you know arb and i'm trying to understand some of the intention that was built into this zoning that you are using and you're using you know well to your project um but i'm just trying to reconcile that a little so Apologize for um, kind of a different discussion exactly on that. Thank you, um, Steve. Just one uh, more Steve, small. On, there you go. Yeah, one more small note on history. Um, the you know the original industrial proposal didn't change the FAR limits that were. Um, you know, just this is just on background. Uh, the FAR it kept the FAR of one or one and a half or whatever it was. Um, this was actually the FAR of three came from town meeting along with the extra story. Um, basically, the person who proposed that amendment said, "I want bigger, taller buildings that generate more tax revenue in the industrial district." And town meeting said, "Yeah." <laughs> so that that's just you know that is where the the FAR of three came from. Thank you, Steve. Um, so, Gene or Ken, I don't know if either of you have anything to add further to add on, on this particular discussion. I think that um, Melissa, that there's you know some support in making this project um, the best it it can be with the the the, the project that is in in front of us. Um, you know, in this in this new business, looking to um, establish. Uh, here on this this parcel, um, and I I think you know we we do need to move on with our, our questions and and discussions. Um, Ken or or Jean, um, I know Steve has recently weighed in. If there's anything else that you would like to add to this discussion, um, I I think I would like to to move us on to the next topic. Unless you have anything further to add. Uh, I, I respect Melissa's opinion. I just think that. Uh, opposing that view on this project because of that, I think is uh, is inappropriate. I think something that we should talk about as a board later on, and if we if she feels strongly about that, maybe we should make some changes. But for what is there right now, I think this is, is certainly very appropriate. So I, I, that that said, you know, I also say also want to state that you know the wish of this becoming a lab building. Uh, you know, I, I, I've personally right now working on three lab buildings right now, and there are certain criteria for that. And, you know, some of it just has to do with the synergy uh, around other lab spaces. You know, you're not, they, they like to have that all sort of together. That's where Kendall Square and South, Ant, South Boston is sort of that and Waltham sort of developing that way. But they also have um, transportation, which is Steve's I mentioned earlier where it's either by the, uh, some sort of mass transit or next to a corner, like a highway or something like that. That's stuff we don't have here and we don't have enough space for parking. Um, because uh, as soon as you introduce, you know, 150 to 200 cars, you know, there's not gonna, Dudley Street and, and some of the side streets are not gonna be able to afford that uh, kind of trans transportation. I just can't see that happening here. Uh, so there's certain limitations that we, we, we're sort of stuck with. So, um, you know, I would hate to see all the stuff go 40 B, you know, which is sort of happening with, uh, at the car dealership. It's a nice project, but it's still, 
something that's taken away industrial space. And I, I and um, you know, I just don't. I, I just see this um, aligning with some of our, uh, our interests right now. If we want to change it, let's do it later, but not through actions of uh, voting a project in or out, but let's change it if you want to change that in a different form. That's what not, uh, that's all I want to stay to. Great, thank you, Ken. Jean? Yeah, I, I said what I had to say. I'll just okay. add, you know, I think maybe we should take a look at the uses that are allowed in the industrial zones and for next year decide if we want to make any amendments to any of them. We most certainly do, Jean. We most certainly do. Right. Um, all right. So, Melissa, um, I appreciate the, the discussion, and it sounds like this is something that we will um, take up again following um, town meeting. Um, we can certainly uh, talk, talk about that further. What I'd, I'd like to do is go back to Ken, who had uh, some questions in, a, in another path, and uh, continue our, our questions for the applicant so that we can get to, I'm keeping a list of follow-up items uh, for, for them to address. Uh, Bob, uh, I don't know who they asked in your staff there, but what's the base spacing for, uh, for this building? Is it a 30 by 30 or a 20 by 20? It can't be a 10 by 10. Uh, actually, um, uh, it is a 10 by 10 grid system and that allows us the opportunity to do um, um, you know, factors of, of 10. Uh, so if you've got a, a, a 10 foot grid, uh, that allows us five foot corridors and then a 10 by 10, a 10 by 20, a 10 by 30. Uh, and it's, as, a, as a baseline, as a grid, really gives us uh, ultimate flexibility to um, uh, adjust those storage units uh, as needed. Uh, again, we've got a, a number in there of 740 to 780. And the reason that's there is the market really does help determine um, if we've hit the right uh, number of units. So that 10 by 10 grid allows us to uh, if we have a, a 10 by 30 unit and nobody uses it, uh, we have the ability to subdivide that. Uh, equally so if we have a, uh, an excess of five by 10 units, um, we can uh, uh, combine those to 10 by 10s or something like that. I understand that, Jen. Uh, and that's not my question. I know you have a grid of 10 by 10 and I understand that. I apologize. Uh, your structural columns, um, your structural bays are not going to be 10 by 10. That's not an efficient uh, way of making a steel building. Uh, is well, it, it, it is actually, uh, again, it is actually a 10 by 10 uh, 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 column, and, column and two uh, layout. And so uh, we do have columns every 10 feet. Really? Yes, sir. Okay. You guys are the experts on that, I think, but uh, I've never... I've been doing this for a while, like 30 years now, and I know when you do big spaces, you, you know, columns and footings add up, you know, as opposed to heavier steel beams, but that's well, okay. I think, well, I'll, I'll be glad to, I'll be glad to describe that for you, but actually what this does is it allows us to uh, spread out the load of the building into much smaller portions simply because we have a lot more bearing points, right? And so that 10 by 10 post and beam system allows ultimate flexibility for the layout of the interior space um, you know, it's not like we're trying to get a, a large volume of space, uh, for instance, a, like a large retail or a, a Kmart or something where you have much longer spans. Uh, this really does allow uh, the flexibility we need on a 10 foot grid, uh, spreads the loads out so that the footings uh, are smaller than they would be on, you know, longer spans and heavier loading at each point. All right. Uh, not, I Add to someone's comment not too long ago, you know, say, hey, this building's going to be here 50, 100 years. What if it somebody else comes and can, changes the use? It, it, nobody's going to change the use of self storage. And we we build it specifically for self storage. And, you know, candy, the only thing to do if somebody changes the use is be tear it down. Because I, I, as you know, you couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't no. do anything with not 10 foot. Not, not, a, not a 10 by 10 grid, no. That's right, that's right. Okay, um, is the building slid over as tight as it can be to one side? I was wondering, can we uh, add more, a couple more parking spaces? 
uh, who, who, uh, someone from VHB or some of that? I, I can take that. Eric, uh, that's up. That's you, Eric. Yep, that's me. Um, yeah, no, we're we're pretty maxed out on the on the setback lines. So as far as shifting the building um, to to add more parking spaces, it would it would it would essentially be carving some space out, likely um, into some of the units on that first floor. All right, because you you because you have three parallel spots right there, and those three parallel spots could is instantly become uh, nine. Uh, perpendicular spots there. Um, your driveway is what, what's the width of your driveway? Uh, 24 feet. Okay. Uh, we can give you, I believe, right, Jenny? We can give you a, a, a variance to get it down to 22 or 20, 22. 25, is it 25? 22 feet, get it more narrower. 22. Oh, 22, 22 feet. feet, sorry, I thought you meant the number of spaces. No, no, I'm trying to get the number of spaces up the to 25. The width of the driveway, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to um, get, get that parking number up a little higher. And- uh, That's what I'm saying, I think it has to be up to 25. That's that's 25%. True, okay. If I could say something about the driveway, I'd be hesitant to allow an hour of driveway if they're gonna have people showing up in new halls when they're usually not the best drivers of U-Hauls. So I would be real hesitant about reducing the width of the driveway. If it was one way, I would I agree with you, Gene, but it's two ways. I know, still. I'm 22, two, 22 wide driveway is a pretty wide street for a, a U-Haul, but okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll review it and see what we can we can do with the parking. Okay. May, Thank you. may I ask uh, in the can we get I feel like we hadn't done a good job I, I realized that we're probably just at the 25 percent with this board uh, and that's probably just where it stops but so far as need goes I mean need municipalities that have addressed self-storage like holistically and said okay we're going to do a study and we're going to come up with how many parking needed for self-storage the municipalities around the country that have done that have come up four and six units, no matter what size the store, like if you do a storage facility, that's it. Secondly, like we would never build a self storage facility that didn't have enough parking. Uh, but what happens is, is people don't park at self storage. Uh, the only time they park at a self storage facility is the five minutes that they come and rent the unit. The, the other times that people are coming to our storage unit, they're using the loading space. So what we focus on, we want to make sure if you were to say, hey, you know, Pete, what do you guys focus on? We want to we would focus on getting the four or five spaces we know we need for parking for the people that come for five or 10 minutes, walk in the office, do a lease. I mean, we're doing so many leases these days that are that are act listed. They just come into the office. Boom, show an ID, get to go to their unit. They may not be in there two minutes. But what what we focus on besides that need is is what the is the loading and unloading. Uh, that's where the people come and go to. They don't come and go to a parking place. They come and go to actively load because nobody wants to hang out at a self-storage facility. I kind of wish they did, but it's it's usually not a pleasant visit uh when people have to use it unfortunately you know again we feel a real need uh you know people have needs and that's why they come to us and when they come there they want to get there do their business and get out of there so i just wanted to make sure that we did a good job of demonstrating why you know 11 we we'd say 11 we're just we got way too many parking places i realized this board is limited at 25 percent and some folks on the board may just be one you know i don't want to i don't want to consider anything more but i i just felt like that it was important for you to know somebody that been doing this for 33 years and have built over 100 self-storage facilities and bought 280 self-storage facilities that you know it, it's that's the thing yep that's the I real, appreciate that's the the real Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Ken? 
Uh, I, I'm done. I, I think I, I, I have all of my questions answered right now. Okay. Um, you know, I still have that list that we want to go over. Yes, uh, I have a long list that I will recap at the end. Sure. Great. Thanks, Ken. Jean? All right. Uh, I don't have anything else to add at the moment. Thank you, Jean. Melissa? Um, no, not at this time. Thank you. Steve? Uh, nothing for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. So, um, Attorney Anessi, what I'd like to do is run through the, um, the list that I have of um, items that the board has identified that we'd like to take, uh, like to request that your uh, client take a, take a look at before uh, coming back in front of us again. Um, I'll just run through in the order that they were mentioned. Uh, the first being continuing the fencing along the rear of the site to eliminate light spill from the cars into uh, the park. Uh, address the large white EFIS panel uh, that is to the uh, uh, right of the, um, the, the facade to the right of the building entry. Uh, add plantings uh, on that same, along that same facade next to the building rather than grass on the property line to ensure that we don't have uh, cars driving uh, over that grass planting strip. Um, add an additional indoor bike parking space. Eliminate the monument sign. Actually look at all of the signage in general in terms of bringing the signage into compliance. Uh, there was a request to eliminate the monument sign and to also um, locate the uh, Dudley Street facade sign over the actual entrance. Um, taking a look at the facade, uh, articulating all sides of the building, looking at glazing, masonry, um, perhaps opening up that rear diagonal wall of the building. Um, Lionel also shared some um, metal screening and um, uh, industrial uh, fabric, the uh, scrims, uh, that have uh, some precedence over on Route 2. Um, let's see. Uh, Jean had requested, um, again, as we look at that rear facade, to really understand what it looks like from standing um, out at the, the park over by Mill Brook rather than the mature trees which are shown in the rendering, which would not be there upon construction. Um, move the Looking, look at moving the outdoor short-term bike parking towards the front of the parking area, uh, closer towards the um, closer towards the entrance, so it's clear and visible. Uh, also, moving the handicap accessible space closer to the entrance. Uh, provide the phase two uh, ground assessment for contamination for reference. Uh, potentially uh, look at limiting. Uh, we would add potentially a condition for the size of the truck, uh, the largest truck that could access the space. And so please confirm that would be 24 feet. Uh, I believe that you mentioned you were already planning on pulling the light pole down to minimize the uh, light spillover to Millbrook from 14 feet to 12 feet. I would like you to connect with the town energy manager to look at adding solar panels on the roof rather than just making that solar ready. Uh, look at whether or not the rain leaders can either be incorporated on the interior of the space or if they can be rather than highlighted uh, be made to um, if they run on the exterior incorporate more into the design of the side of the building. Uh, And that's everything I had. So if any member of the board, is there something that you indicated that I did not cover, Jean? Did you mention the solar on the roof? I did mention that to connect with the town energy manager about solar panel programs for the roof. And moving the bicycle or the sun. Yes. Okay, thanks, sorry. Great. Rachel, in addition to what you've just indicated, <clears throat> will Jenny be generating a list for us as well? I, as, I, she, I, as she has done in the past. 
Yes, I'm, I'm always generating a list and we will be following. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That would be great. And I had Thank additional you. items too. <clears throat> great. Uh, Jenny, do, do you want to list? Can I ask a point of order? Sure. Um, the questions that were asked by the public, are they also on some list somewhere? Uh, I Several of them had been addressed previously by the um, applicant. If you would like to submit any that were not addressed this evening, that weren't addressed to your satisfaction, you're more than welcome to send an email to the board and we can follow up with the applicants. Okay, so the questions that I kind of listed serially. Right, so some of them I felt had already been answered by the applicant, so we didn't rehash them um, this evening. But if you felt that they were not answered to your satisfaction, you're more than welcome to submit those questions okay. to the board and we can get them to the applicant. All right, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, um, so with this, this uh, list of items, and again, Jenny um, will follow up and I also would be happy to, um, to uh, review you know, any list and, and make sure that we have everything captured. Um, we need to look at a date to continue the hearing to. Uh, so Jenny, I don't know if you could pull up our calendar. I'm trying to pull it up right now. Eric, Eric uh, what kind of time should we, uh, we be talking about, Eric? Yeah, I think we want to take some time, review the questions um, with the team, and then we can come. I mean, it's conservation is realistically to get information in for the, if we were gonna get in for the seventh, it would have to be in tomorrow. So I think as far as the hearing goes for conservation, it's more of an update and the next hearing for them That's would all. be yes. the 21st. So I guess, you know, we're probably looking, you know, at least a month out here. And that's probably what we're talking about anyway. Is that right, Rachel? Yes, yes, which is, uh, we'll be into town meeting at that point, uh, but we can look at, Jenny, I believe we'd have to look at an earlier start time. Yeah, so if you want to meet on the 27th at like 6.30, that would be the next option. You're already booked on the 25th. And I still need to find a date. Well, I think we're going to do the other daycare hearing on the 2nd. So that leaves this 27th. So that'll be three fairly long evenings. Yep. Take that, Eric. They're going to work for us. When does the material, sense. when does the response to comments package need to be into you oh, by, for that? We would need it by probably Friday, the 22nd. Um, yeah, the latest. Is that too soon based upon conservation? I think I'd like to try to hold that date if we can, and then, um, you know, follow back up if, if based okay. on discussions with conservation, if, if it makes sense to push it. The if alternative would be fourth. Fourth. Yeah, of May. I'm thinking that may be more realistic, but I'd, I'd like to leave that to the, to our, you know, to my client, to uh, Pete and, and Jesse. Like whatever. It just means that if you can't meet on the 27th, this board needs to meet to continue your hearing. So I think they'd probably prefer that you decide which date you want. Okay. So so May 4th? Is that no. what was? Let me, uh, this is Jesse. 27th would be ideal if you can get the materials in by that date. I have a conflict on the 4th. Okay, we'll shoot for the 27th. Let's do that. Thank you. The materials much. need to be in by the 22nd. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, any other? Uh, so uh, we will look to continue this to April 27th. Is there a motion to uh, continue the hearing for docket 3690 to April 27th from the board? No motions. Is there a second? Second. We'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Keen? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So we will see you back on uh, the evening of April 27th, and that will be at Jenny's 6.30 p.m. 
6.30 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Um, so that brings us to the uh, end of our meeting. We previously had covered um, agenda items three through five. So is there a motion to adjourn? So motioned. Is there a second? Second. Uh, we'll take a vote. Kim? Yes. Dean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.